Good morning. Welcome to the special board of education meeting board of trustee workshop on June 5th. We just came out of closed session. Um, I would like to, do we have anything to report out on the closed session? I don't think we do. Something. No action. There's no action to taken. Out. And we're gonna do the pledge. Okay, so let's have Don. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Dan. A broadcast and recording is being made at the direction of the board, and the broadcast may capture images and sounds of those attending the meeting. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Governor Newsom issued an executive order in 2920, which temporarily suspends provisions of the Brown Act relating to the public meetings. As such, the Cordova Unified School District board members will con be conducting open session board meetings via Zoom video conferencing, teleconferencing. The meetings will also be live streamed on the district's YouTube channel. The public's health and well-being are the top priority for the Board of Trustees of Folsom Cordova Unified School District. And you are urged to take all appropriate health and safety precautions. Public comments encouraged and can be done in writing or during the virtual board meeting using the raised hand feature. Folsom Cordova Unified School District Board Policy 1313 promotes mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct among employees, parents, and the public. We will treat staff, parents, and members of the public with respect and expect the same in return. If any member of the public uses obscenities or communicates in a demanding, loud, insulting, and or demeaning manner, the board will calmly and politely admonish the person to communicate civilly. Speakers who wish to make public comment to the board in Spanish or Russian will have their comments translated to English. Written comments were accepted until 3 p.m. today? No, 4, 4 p.m. What? 4 p.m. yesterday, sorry, excuse me. These comments were emailed to the board prior to the board meeting for review and will not be read out loud during the meeting. At the direction of the board and the Supreme will call roll to acknowledge the board received all electronic comments submitted yesterday at 4 p.m. today, uh, yesterday, as it pertains to today's board meeting. Superintendent, please call roll. Mr. Reed. Here. Mr. Short. Here. Mr. Hoover. Here. Mr. Clark. Here. Mr. Hooley. Here. Five zero. Okay, thank you. With that said, we're going to, we didn't report out the closed session and we need to adopt the agenda. Do I'll move it. We have a first second. by Mr. Clark, second by Mr. Hoover. Superintendent, roll call. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Short. Aye. Mr. Hoover. Aye. Mr. Clark. Aye. Mr. Hooley. Aye. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you very much. With that said, we're going to be moving into the item five, uh, seven board workshop, which is um, item A. A review draft board policy 415A equity and compassionate dialogue protocol. Superintendent? Yes, and we're excited to have this topic on our workshop agenda this morning. And we have some guests that are joining us today, um, two from Epic Education and our very own Dr. Peace. And I see her on the screen and she's attending virtually as well as our wonderful guests from Epic Education, Dr. Nancy Dome, who's a renowned speaker and leader on equity in school systems and workplaces with over, over 20 years of experience as a childcare worker, a teacher, and a professor. And we also have Kelly Cole from Epic Education. She brings 20 years of facilitation experience and is the Director of Programming and Innovation with Epic Education. And Dr. Peace is going to um, more formally introduce our guests and the presentation that we have uh, that will be a, a joint presentation between Dr. Peace and our consultants and an opportunity for the board to dive um, into our draft policy and ask some questions and, and um, bring it forward uh, before we come back in the fall. So Dr. Peace, welcome. 
Good morning. Um, good morning, President Short, board members, and Dr. Kalihian. Um, Ms. Goldsmith, can we bring up the presentation? Perfect. Uh, so it's with great honor that I'm here this morning to present the draft of our board policy and also to introduce you to our wonderful partners at Epic Education. Uh, Dr. Nancy Dome, Nancy Dome is a renowned speaker and leader on equity in school systems and workplaces with over 20 years in the education field as a child care worker, teacher, and professor. She has provided professional development to school districts and educational agencies throughout the United States. Her expertise and experience supports transformative culture change, providing the trainings, tools, and leadership to diverse organizations. Through an innovative approach of learning, Epic Education provides online courses accessible to clients in real time with relevant content. Dr. Dome's approach is to meet clients where they are and to help them uh, reach measurable goals that ultimately change the educational experience and outcomes for all students. Dr. Dome works with several community groups um, as a mentor and, enjoy, and enjoys supporting local performing arts. Her time to unwind and relax is spent in Montana with friends and the great outdoors. Next slide. And Ms. Kelly Cole brings over 20 years of facilitation and community experience as a director of programming and innovation with Epic Education. She specializes in individual coaching with a particular emphasis on leadership. Uh, Kelly also guides Epic's trainer team in the development of facilitation on impactful and effective equity and inclusion programming. Next slide. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to our EPIC team. Thank you, Dr. Pease. I'm gonna go ahead and get our PowerPoint up. All right. Okay. So um, Compassionate Dialogue is the, the workshop that we have planned for today. And um, again, we are honored to be here to uh, provide this, uh, this brief workshop um, for you. Um, and we will walk through what Compassionate Dialogue is and how, how we use it uh, to facilitate difficult conversations. Um, understanding that it, we need to have those conversations in order to move forward. So we always like to start off with a quote and um, to help get us grounded in the conversation. And so this morning, we'd like to start off with this one. The more we practice tolerating discomfort, the more confidence you'll gain in your ability to accept new challenges. And we use this quote to get us off is that um, we've, we've kind of come to a place where um, we, we, we are now kind of conflating this idea that, that somehow being just uncomfortable is that we're unsafe. And I, I'd like to offer and just invite us to a space that, that really kind of looks deeply at that construct and starts to think about nothing great ever happened in this country, in this world, without us having discomfort. If everything was perfect, and just, you know, just there, there would be no reason to innovate. There would be no reason to change anything. And so it's through this discomfort that we're able to work through um, the things that we think separate us and really begin to find common ground on the things that unite us. So um, this is what we'd like to use to kind of just set the stage for today um, as we move forward. So compassionate dialogue, just in the big picture, is literally the idea that we're able to have a conversation or discussion to resolve a problem or find a solution through connection and showing empathy for others. I think that um, too many, and I'm sure everyone who's listening, the board, you know, we, we all know that there's been this very divisive um, kind of inflammatory um, interaction um, between people. And I think that, that part of the problem is that we have, I think, forgotten really how to show up with compassion for each other. I can interact with someone who has completely different views from me and still show respect and still show empathy and still care about their outcomes. And so 
what we want to do with compassionate dialogue is actually provide a tool that allows us to monitor ourselves so that we're able to show up in a way that that leads to kind of a more um, collaborative interaction that can resolve issues. And when we say resolve, and we'll talk about that, resolve doesn't mean happy ending always. Sometimes resolution um, means that, you know, we, you know, I, I guess it's a, a better to use a verse. It's like people come into our lives for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. And we need to understand that that's a natural part, that not everyone we come into contact with is necessarily meant to be there for our entire lives, and it's okay. But we don't have to end those relationships or make changes through hatred or anger. We can do that through love and through compassion and through empathy. And so compassionate dialogue is a tool to reach that goal. And um, we, we want to talk about why we focus this way because sometimes compassionate dialogue can seem like a soft skill um, and really it, it is a challenging practice and so when we talk about it why we want to focus on it is um, collectively it helps us actually implement change that is sustainable and be consistent in our actions and it does this because we actually build trust and safety so we can have some difficult conversations with each other and we can be thoughtful in our cycles of inquiry um, and challenge ourselves to be consistent with what we say our values are. And we can support each other when we veer off that course um, in a way that is about a higher good, um, not just about challenging individuals. Um, it also helps us be innovative because if, if we are afraid to say the wrong thing in front of each other, we're, we're never gonna stretch our understanding. And so a place where we can actually practice, um, take missteps, help each other course correct um, with openness, um, be allowed to fail and try again, it, it's gonna help us actually create innovative practices. And the final piece is um, it helps us take collective responsibility. So if we want um, change, innovative change, it can't just rely on a few people. It really needs to be a collective effort. And that means we need to be able to talk to each other about what our expectations are. We need to be able to set boundaries with how we talk to each other, how we support each other, set protocols about how are we gonna stay engaged when it gets hard with each other, when our inclination is to shut down. And so that's this collective piece of it. But there's also these individual pieces about this process. And so um, the protocol that we're gonna go through today is really the framework or the tool that gets us to this place of compassionate dialogue. And when we have a framework, um, it can keep us anchored, especially in the midst of topics where there's a strong emotional response, there are strong beliefs that surface, conversations can become heated. And so part of what we're gonna to learn today is what is our agreed upon language so that if things become inflammatory, I know how to stay within myself, I can stay with you. And we've got a common language about how we're gonna navigate this together. It also helps us um, manage our expectations. As you'll see, we're not um, assuming that everyone's gonna have the same agreement. And so really it sets us up to come to each other with curiosity. So if I'm asking you a question, it's because I genuinely want to understand where your perspective is coming from, especially if it's really different from mine. Um, it helps us remember why we're here. So we want a space where we can collectively solve our problems. And so it, it gives me something to check in on is how I'm about to respond gonna help us collectively solve our problems or am I coming from a place that is about my individual perspective? Am I, am I open to hearing from somebody who has a different perspective than me. Um, it, it makes our how more effective because again, we have a common language. So as you see, there's three steps to this protocol we're gonna go through and it helps us focus on, um, have a collective understanding of where we are with each other as we're talking. There's space for connection because again, that compassion piece is, I, I'm not here to shut you down I'm here to understand and listen, and I'm gonna ask the same of you. Can you hear my perspective as well? And can we see where we need based on that? Um, the process we're going to go through also helps with self-regulation because it, we're, it asks a level of emotional maturity from all of us that especially in moments of, heat, of heated 
emotions, topics. What am I going to do to self-regulate so that I can actually stay engaged with you? And so we'll walk through what that process is to help us take responsibility also for how we show up in a space and how we receive others. And then the final piece is it really is a form of taking care of ourselves because when we don't talk about these things, they fester in us personally, they fester in our relationships and our organizations. And so being able to have these hard conversations and say what needs to be said and um, not hide or stifle things, um, it, it is about the health of us individually, but it's also about the health of our organization, which is ultimately about the health of our students. We're creating a healthy home for our students to come into because the adults in the space have an understanding of how we're gonna engage um, respectfully with each other. Okay, so the first one, um, of the protocol. It's called the compassionate dialogue is what we consider the umbrella. And then underneath the umbrella is this tool, this protocol that's called the RIR protocol. So the first R stands for recognize. And recognize is really an opportunity for us to first check in with how we feel about something um, and, and mitigate that response before we really to stop us from reacting and really allow us to respond. Because when we're reacting, it, it can be we, it can be out of control. It can be something that we really haven't been able to think about very much, but we're just saying something. So when we recognize our feelings and mitigate that feeling first, then I can show up to the next stage with really kind of grounded first in myself and ready to talk. Now, this is super important because typically when you're in positions of leadership, especially or authority, uh, we we're, we tend to be really good at the the second the I and the second R the interrupt and repair but I, um, we're not ready yet for that Kel <laughs> give me one sec um, when we uh, uh, when we when we uh, when we're in those leadership roles, we're used to taking care of business. We're used to getting things done. Um, but we really, when we don't do this first R, we miss an opportunity to actually understand what impact my own stuff, my own beliefs, my own um, values might be having on the decisions that I'm making. And so we begin to see that if we don't spend time to really recognize what our feelings are on the issue or the engagement or topic, then we can be adding our own beliefs and values about it, our own, you know, it could be our own luggage around it um, that then changes the outcome. And it takes away our ability, our ability to be more objective. And so what we wanna do with the first recognize is really tap into what does it make you feel? And we find sometimes that people struggle. I did an interview with a gentleman who was um, the CEO of Ma Pa Bell in California, you know, 20 years ago, you know, very high powered, um, C-suite, amazing man. But when we did this together, it took him over 10 minutes to get to the feeling because he wasn't used to bringing feelings into the workplace. It was, but it was still impacting his decision-making. And when we finally got to the feelings, what he was able to uncover was that he had been bullied as a young man. And uh, this was impacting his decision. So he was coming down hard on people, you know, doing things. And he was like, I can, I can now own my own stuff and show up more objectively. When it came time to interrupt and repair, he had no problem doing it. And so this idea of being clear on what is my stuff and then what is what and what belongs in the space. And so when we recognize a feeling, we recognize what happens in our body, you know, where am I feeling it? And then based on that, what does that make me think? So do I think that this is inherently bad just because I've had a reaction? And, and, and if that's the case, does it mean that I'm not making room for someone to show up differently, even though it's triggering something in me? And so we really, really ask uh, folks to lean in in this space. And this sometimes is uncomfortable because I, I, I don't think that we've been really accustomed to uh, recognizing and being vulnerable because when we bring up feelings, that's, that's a piece of vulnerability um, in, in our public spaces. Um, so the second part of the protocol is the I and the I is interrupt and uh, interrupt using compassionate dialogue is really about inquiry. So when I recognize that something that has been said or done triggers, and I'm speaking now personally for myself, has triggered anger in me, then I know 
that I need to, <laughs> my friend always says, ride my emotional wave. I've got to ride that wave because if I don't, then I'm going to say something. And it's not that I'm not going to mean what I say, but it's just not going to be effective. It's going to come across as harsh or, or judgmental. And, and that's, if I'm, my goal is compassionate dialogue, and if my goal is really to seek to understand and to build connection with you, then me showing up and interrupting with accusations or interrupting with judgment is, is just going to derail any possibility of connection. And so when we talk about interrupt in this in the sense of the protocol and compassionate dialogue, we're really talking about inquiry. So my thing is, what questions can I can I ask to learn more or discover the intent? Like what 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 can that question be so that I can even be sure that I've understood what was said? Because a lot of times, because again in the recognize, um, a lot of times we hear something that actually is not intended by the speaker because we are, again, are bringing our own stuff in there. So let's get clear through the interrupt process that I'm even, I've even heard what I thought I heard. Um, the other piece of the, uh, proto uh, the interrupt is if, if you can't ask, not yet, Kel. <laughs> Um, if we can't ask the, the question, then how can I voice another um, experience? And, and that's an example would be literally uh, just saying, you know, well, I, I can see that, but I've actually had a different experience with. And so we begin to say, see that there's multiple perspectives that show up and we're creating space. So we're broadening our, our, our kind of lens that we're looking through. And then um, finally, we can just share the impact. And impact is really important because um, intentions and impact are different things. Um, I can have the best intentions. And, and, and I think for me, I always say I'm a Sagittarian and a fire horse, and um, I don't really have a malicious bone in my body, but I can promise you that I've probably, I, not probably, I can promise you that I've hurt people in my, in my life. And it wasn't intentional. So my intent was not to hurt you, but the impact was that I did. And so how do we resolve that? How do we focus on the impact and allow me to own that? You know what, I know that wasn't my intention, but I acknowledge that the impact was different. And so how can we go beyond that instead of, you know, in this case, me being crucified because I, um, I, I, I hurt you, but I didn't intend to. So how do we how do we massage those things and stay focused on the impact so that I can be more mindful about my actions in the future? And then finally, the third part of the protocol, the third R is repair. And I always say that <laughs> repair is a strategy that rarely happens unless you're in the same household uh, because you can only ignore somebody for so long. Um, you can, you know, go to your rooms, go to your corners, and then you're not talking for a few days. But at some point, you got to repair it. You got to come back together. But in the workplace, repair doesn't always have to happen. And I think that this is where we get stuck a lot, especially in education. Well, and not just even especially, I think in, in, in any place where multiple people are working together is that we have this this interaction that you know may have been uncomfortable. It may not have been bad, but there was some level of discomfort, and then we go away. But the problem is we go away, and then our minds get to start working again and start to you know kind of breaking down the interaction and other things come up. And so the next time you see that person that you have that interaction with, there there's some like, are we okay? There's this little bit of hesitancy. And engaging, and a lot of times, and I, you know, I, I definitely have seen this as a teacher um, when I was in the classroom. Was that a lot of times our, you know, our, our people who were, you know, maybe not great friends, but who had a professional relationship, just stopped talking to each other because they never did the repair. And so the repair says, "What can I do to continue to stay connected and in relationship?" with this person and also with myself and others. And so if I have this discourse with you and, and we, you know, we, we're navigating it, what can I do a day later, a week later, a month later to, to, let, to just let us know that we're okay? Because really most of us are conflict avoidant, but nothing great ever happened without some sort of conflict, some sort of discomfort. And so if I can come back around and just, you know, maybe the, the repair is just re-engaging and saying, hey, let's grab a cup of coffee. Maybe the repair is talking a little bit more and acknowledging, like, I know that was a hard conversation, but I really appreciate your time. 
you know, this notion that we can, we can begin to normalize this idea that difficult conversations don't have to mean that we're not friends anymore, that we can't work together anymore, or that we can't talk anymore. It's really about, you know, how do we come together and we're like, okay, that was tough, but we, we survived it and actually we're better because of it. And, and that, that piece is the piece that probably is um, the, the one that gets missed the most often, but it's the one that really changes the game of how we're able to continue to, to work together and, and support each other, even when we don't agree. Because again, the protocol isn't about me convincing you that you're right or, or convincing you that you're wrong and I'm right. It's not about that. It's really about seeking to understand each other and figuring out how we can work together within those parameters. So this discomfort part, you know, how do we sit with discomfort? And it, it's it's one of those things when, you know, when when we are so used to avoiding being uncomfortable, we really have to understand what happens to us, what makes it uncomfortable. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I was doing a training um, with a uh, community college system and, uh, you know, we were, we were talking and um, a woman said, she said, I feel, she goes, I feel unsafe. And I, I said, well, we have to stop the training because um, I want to understand what unsafe means. And um, I said, what, what, what is happening in my presentation that you feel unsafe? And she, she said, well, I, it's just this, I just, and I said, well, is it unsafe or is it uncomfortable? She goes, I guess it's uncomfortable, but the problem is language is powerful. And the minute you say that you're unsafe, you've now made me unsafe. And we have to stop and talk about that. And so when she was able to really find herself on this discomfort place and say, you know what, I'm just uncomfortable because I'm not used, you know, I've never been in a space where we were having these kinds of conversations. We, will, we were able to move beyond it and move and, and like and move beyond it in a, in a powerful way because she was able to lean in and really just take that breath. But we have to be willing to stop. So what does discomfort look like for you and your body? How are you noticing um, you know, your resistance to something because, you know, you're having this reaction. And because again, we've been so conditioned to, to, when we feel this way to just shut down. And so what would happen if instead of shutting down in that discomfort that we actually just kind of relaxed and just took a deep breath and maybe asked some questions and let that feeling pass so that we could actually get to a place of resolving whatever was causing that discomfort. And what I will say about the protocol is um, if anyone in there, um, we've all tried to play an instrument, you know, maybe play a sport, maybe learn a second language or third language. All of those things have one thing in common. And that is in order to be any good at any of those things, we have to practice. And this conversation is no different. If we are not practicing having these difficult conversations, we will never be good at them and we will always find ways to detour, or shut them down. And so my level of discomfort begins to change. You know, initially when I started having these conversations 20 years ago, they, I, I didn't love them. I wasn't super comfortable with them. But as I, over time, continue to have these conversations, I realize that my discomfort level is completely different. I don't hit a discomfort level you know, it, 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 my threshold is so much higher and so different than it was 20 years ago when I started these conversations because I've practiced. And so the invitation for us around this protocol is to practice. Thank you, Nancy. And, um, and just pausing into that recognized place, we, we will use this as a tool because as Dr. Dome was saying, um, usually uh, there's something underneath the way we're showing up in a space. And so um, my first reaction um, is often not the whole story. And so really slowing down to understand, am I, uh, am I uncomfortable right now? Or actually, am I feeling um, uh, threatened? Because this is a new space for me. And so part of this is also being able to name where we are because it is also going to invite a different kind of openness. Um, we have another colleague who, um, I love the way that she puts this and she says, it, when we are in these conversations, um, the recognize is gonna help me tap into the vulnerability that I have accessible to me in this moment. Especially if we are in cultures or climates where there is distrust 
amongst our colleagues, um, uh, among, amongst our spaces. It is hard to get into this space because nobody wants to make the first gesture towards vulnerability. And so slowing down in this recognize um, also helps us think about, okay, this person may be showing up in a way that is really triggering me, but what I wanna understand is what is underneath that? What is happening for them? Because that's the place where we get to have some dialogue. And we think about it with our students. Um, we know that the behavior of our students is a reflection of something deeper going on. And so our good pedagogical practices are to try to understand what is happening underneath and not just react to the surface behavior. And it's the same with the adults in our spaces. So if I'm in a difficult or tense conversation, part of my work is to recognize what's happening for me and also, do I have an already always about who you are? Or can I allow myself to be in a space where I'm gonna pause, regulate, so I can actually hear you and make sure it's not just my assumptions that are how I'm perceiving you. And part of that is being able to slow down and understand what, what am I actually feeling in this moment and how is what I'm feeling impacting how I'm responding to you. And so we're gonna take an opportunity to kind of walk through these three pieces one at a time so you can see the, the actual practice and process of it. Okay, so we're gonna practice and what's gonna happen, um, and this is, I, I hope, participatory. Um, we're, we're gonna ask you to respond um, in, this, in, in these moments. And so um, we're, gonna, we're gonna show you four scenarios. And I wanna first just share that these scenarios on the cards that we're gonna share with you are not, we didn't make them up. And so over a course of about six months, um, working with one of our districts in, 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 um, in Marin uh, County, uh, we, we would do this training and they were like, we need tools to practice. And so what we did was we just say, okay, what are, what are things that you've heard, things that you've said, um, or things that you've witnessed that you wish you would have interrupted, but you didn't know how to, either you were afraid or felt like you weren't the right person or whatever. So it could not be a statement that you felt comfortable interacting with. It had to be a statement that caused you a level of discomfort and you couldn't and you couldn't intervene, but you wish you would have you would have. So the statements you're going to see again are not created by us. They're solicited by our um, our clients who have um, allowed us to create this deck that we now use for people to practice. And basically it's just things that people encounter. So we're going to go one card at a time and we're going to put a statement up and I'm going to read it. And so my invitation is uh, since the boardroom is all on one computer, um, we're going to ask if you verbalize. Um, what is the feeling word when you hit, hear the statement? And don't don't um, don't try to figure out or like what is the first thing that comes because that's that's a feeling that we're trying to get into when you hear the statement mentioned. And so we're going to read the first one. We'll invite you to speak up, and um, and then we'll just go through it. And we're not, we're not. There's no judgment about the statements. It's just the first thing, and people are going to have varying responses. And so uh, we get an opportunity just to to go through that. So, Kel, next slide, please. All right. The first card is: I don't have privilege. I grew up poor and worked for everything I have. So when you hear that statement, what comes up? What feeling? And again, feeling word. What feeling comes up for you? I think for me, the feeling of understanding. Okay, and I'm going to have you dig a little deeper. Thank you so much. But so understanding is um, is still external. Is there a feeling beneath the understanding? Like, is it curiosity? Is it, you know what I mean? So how do we get to that feeling word? Well, I think when you're talking about privilege, it's like, okay, in, in what context? Are you talking about privilege? Privilege in what exactly? Because okay. I need to understand that before we move forward. Okay. So, uh, and again, so this is, and this is, this is where um, I'm going to slow us down. And 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 I, I'm sorry. Uh, what's your name? Just because I want to be able to. Uh, Chris. Cliff. Chris. Okay. Okay. So what what I want to do is right now you're in your thinking mind. 
really trying to to get that and there's nothing wrong with that but and but you're you're trying to figure it out and we don't know we can't actually figure it out until we can ask those questions that you mentioned so there is a feeling that got you thinking about those things to know more before you could have it so the questions that you you've already gone to interrupt because you're trying to understand <laughs> right but my my thing is how do we stick in the feeling first? So what made you want to even ask that question? What feeling was the core that made you even want to know more? Well, in the context of privilege, I mean, what kind of privilege are we talking about? Okay, but you're still an interrupt. You're still asking the question and what I'm trying to get us to get to a feeling. So, hey, Kel, can you do me a favor? Can you go back to the, the wheel? And, and this is and this is perfect because it happens. This is the example I gave you of Dave Part. It happens all the time, especially when we're in leadership roles. We're in our minds trying to fix it. But really the goal, the, the first R is so crucial because it changes how we engage. And so when we talk about feelings, if you look at that inner circle, those are what I would call your core emotions. As you move out into the margins of the circles, those are more the ancillary emotions. And if you, you know, feel overwhelmed, for instance, as you drill down, the overwhelmed can really be more about being feared, fearful, you know, like you're you're anxious and then you're you're fearful. So we have to get to a feeling, which is, you know, this wheel says there's seven kind of core um, feelings that we have. And then you have these ancillary feelings that come out of that. So we need to find something in the first R that's within the, this wheel. So that, because an understanding, like for me, and I, I don't want to project on you. So, you know, one thing that comes up by your, by the question you're asking is that maybe the feeling you have is curiosity you know, maybe that's a feeling you're dealing with because you're trying to understand what privilege means. But we, if we can't tap into that first R, then you, you're, you're being guided, but, you, but you're not guiding yourself. It, it's shifting. So we want to shift the control from our, our feelings that we haven't thought about, like leading us and me knowing that's feeling and then taking control and leading from there. So I, I'm going to invite us, like invite you to think about is there a feeling underneath that question? Dr. Dome, could you read us the inner circle of those feelings? Because I, 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 I Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm looking right at it. Actually, I can answer that then. I mean, if, if we're talking say, about oh, those feelings, yeah. it would probably be more surprised, okay. uh, if anything, um, because I'm just kind of perplexed on, you know, what that statement really mean or you know what do you mean by that so yeah. i guess i would use surprised great and perplexed too both of those are feelings and so that's where we just wanted to get to but you see that that like it takes per so now when i think and we'll stick with this for a second but kelly you can go back to the um the question the first one um so if you if the feeling that comes up for you is surprised or perplexed what is your, you know, what you get to think about as we move through is then what is your next step? Because I would assume that surprised or perplexed leads you more to curiosity as opposed to if the statement triggered anger or, or, or fear, right? So each of those core emotions elicits some different reaction from us. And the whole purpose of understanding that first R, and I know it may seem like overkill for you right now as I'm talking through this, but the whole purpose of understanding that first R is that then when I understand what it's triggered in me, I can actually take control of my feelings and know that, okay, this has triggered what happened in my body. What does it make me think of? It makes me think of you know, whatever. And so then I get to put that aside and then I can actually engage from a more neutral place. I don't ever believe that we get to a completely objective neutral place. I don't think it's possible. But I think that if I interrupt my emotions um, and really get to the, what is the core that I wanna understand about this, I can, I can begin to kind of move them aside. So thank you so much. And thank you. So stay with that, Kel. Is there anyone else who wants to share well, a feeling? I, I could go. I, it makes me feel happy. Happy? Yeah, because okay. I grew up poor and had to work for a lot of things. It's called you, you earn something mm -hmm. and you work hard so you feel accomplished. Okay. It wasn't, nothing was handed to me. 
Okay. So you feel accomplished. So it makes me feel like I've done something good because I wasn't privileged. I had to work hard. Nothing was handed to me. Okay. You grew up on a poor ranch. You have to work hard for it. So it makes me happy that I was able to do that. Okay, great. And so, and then what we begin to see is that we already have two in the same room, you know, you're on the same board, we already have two different responses, right? And so you really begin to understand how unique each of us are in these spaces. And, and by understanding that it actually allows us to broaden um, our expectation of how people get to show up. Right, because your experience growing up poor on a farm is different than my experience growing up poor in Los Angeles, right? Is different than someone else's experience oh, yeah. growing yeah. up having resources, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so you begin to see how each of us brings our story to our, our work, to everything, not just our work, but to everything that we do. And so in understanding our own stories, we begin to not let them control us. Right, we begin to actually lean back and say, okay, I get that. I know why that makes me happy, but I can also now understand why that makes someone surprised or why that makes, because they have a different story behind it. Mm -hmm. So is there one more person you'd like to share on that one? Yeah, I, I guess I will. Okay. Um, is, is acceptance a feeling? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I, 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 I would say that's more an ancillary. Can you drill it down a little bit more? Um, can I drill it down? Uh, I, I guess um, I, I don't disagree with the statement. So uh, what, um, other than, what would be another adjective for acceptance? Uh, um, it, or um, like, I, mean, you know, I don't like- Recognized. Rec yeah, recognized or substantiated or yeah, yeah. Valued. Valued. validated. 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 Think, that was the word I was looking yeah, for. Validated. <laughs> um, although I, I have to admit, um, after hearing Mr. Clark's um, um, you know curiosity, I think he he mentioned, I actually you know the more I read that statement, I I'm like, all right, I understand where he's coming from on curiosity um, as well because. Yeah, you know, I, I suppose you could grow up poor and still be privileged. So, um, but yeah, um, so that, that's, that's just my, my thought. Yeah, thank you. That's perfect. And so again, you, you know, the reason why we practice is because we begin to, we begin to see how different we really are. And, and, and that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It, it, it increases our ability when we enter through empathy to make space for people to show up differently. And that's what we really need to do. Um, we, we're, not, we're not robots. We're not, you know, we're not gonna all show up. And just because we may, you know, on the surface look the same or, you know, live in the same neighborhoods doesn't mean that we're having the same experiences, right? I like seek to understand, to be understood. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right, so the second card, we're, we're gonna progressively move and try to uh, continue to explore some of these topics. Um, you're good at giving directions for a woman. When you hear that, what feeling comes up for you? I'll go angry. Yeah. Angry. That was, see, that was, you tapped into that really quick, right? Yep. Okay. And so when angry, and so again, and we'll, Kelly will walk us through this and then interrupt a little more, but what I'm going to invite you to do right now is that if you're angry and you don't ride that emotional wave, what might be something you say, and I'm not asking you, this is more um, rhetorical right now, um, but what happens if you don't mitigate that feeling, right? Because if I, if, you, if someone says you're good at giving directions for a woman, and if I know for me as a woman, if I don't ride that emotional wave, I may say something that's, that's equally offensive because I'm angry. And so if I'm striving for the goal of compassionate dialogue, I really need to mitigate my own feelings and get to a question that will help me understand what, what is behind the statement, right? Yeah. So um, anyone else want to throw a feeling in for that? I kind of, well, I do kind of angry and surprised that anybody would say that. So it kind of makes you angry and surprised that somebody would say yeah. that. Yeah. And again, remember, these are real things from real people. So, you know, oh, these are wow. things that are happening, you know. I think um, the wheel had disgusted on it. So we'll go yeah. with that. Yeah, you'll go with <laughs> disgusted. Okay. All right. Any Go ahead. on the wheel right I don't know. yeah 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 oh it's on the wheel for sure <laughs> um anyone else in the room well as a woman i'd say sad yeah 
Sad. Sad. Okay. Yeah, that is sad. Yeah. Yeah. So again, you begin to see the myriad responses, right, to the same statement. And that's happening all the time. All the time we see something and each of us is filtering it through our own lenses. And we're assuming that all of us are feeling the same way, but we don't always feel the same way about it. And that's what we get to get to the bottom of. Okay, next one. Uh, you're a credit to your race. <laughs> God, man. What feeling comes up for you? Ignorance. Ignorance is a, is a judgment. Okay, so. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go back to angry then. Okay, <laughs> okay. You, okay, great. Um, I, would, you know? I would go with angry as well. Yeah. Okay. Angry. Okay. Anyone else? Um, I wish. Yeah, I don't have the wheel in front of me, but that was helpful. <laughs> <laughs> don't get the picture. How do you feel? I'm bad with feelings. Yeah. Well, you know, and 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 I appreciate you saying that because I think a lot of us are, yeah. in all honesty. Um, I think a lot of us, again, and especially um, for men, um, men have been in, in our society kind of conditioned not to, you know, you have them, but you're not really allowed to share them or tap into them. And so they become something that's ignored, um, you know, for not, I'm, I don't, I'm generalizing, please understand that I know that too. Um, not all men fall in that, but I just think, you know, kind of, uh, generally men have not really been allowed to show their emotions and to tap into those. And so I think they get lost sometimes. And so um, again, practice, you know, practice, you know, what, what, what am I feeling? Like, it, it's kind of like if anyone saw the movie Runaway Bride and, you know, she had to figure out how she liked her eggs because every partner she was with, she ate the eggs the way they did. And then finally she sat in the kitchen eating like eggs 20 different ways to find out the way <laughs> for eggs right and and that's kind of I think that's where like I have to look at what am I feeling because so many times we just jump we like I said we jump to the interrupt we jump to the you know to some form of repair but if we're not tapping into that feeling first I can guarantee you that whether you're aware of it or not your feelings are impacting your reaction your interrupt there's no way that they can't um and yeah. we have one more um one more uh it's just he or she, simple as that. Hmm. I think someone said this, the last card, but uh, off mic, it holds true for me on this one. I think embarrassed probably is mm -hmm. fair. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you. I guess I don't know what that means to have a feeling. Confused. Yeah. So there you go. That's a feeling. Exactly. So confused. Like I'm so so if you're confused, and as we think about what Kelly's going to do with the interrupt, you know, then confusion means that your interruption might be really questions to clarify, right? Yeah. Yeah. To, to understand. And so no problem. Um, anyone else? Mine's mine was the same as David's confused. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Kel, do we have one more? Is that the last one? There we go. Um, what are they cooking over there? The smell is atrocious. Can't they just have a sandwich like everyone else? <laughs> <laughs> what the heck? What feeling comes up for you? I'm probably really say angry. Perplexed. Perplexed, angry. Yeah. Angry, yeah. Upset, that doesn't make yeah. any sense. Upset. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and so the whole purpose of practicing this is for us to get in touch with our feelings and you all did an excellent job because, because that is the first hurdle is yeah. identifying a feeling so that in, if I'm perplexed or if I'm uh, curious or if I'm angry, what does that mean when I interrupt, right? How does that impact my interrupt? So what I'd like you to do is go back one, Kel. Just go back one. No, back one. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'd like you to consider, out of the five statements that we shared with you, um, I'd like you to consider the statement that triggered you the most. Just kind of get it in your head. And you already identified the feeling so that we don't need to do that. But um, just keep that statement in your head. And now I'm going to ask you the next two questions, one at a time. And this is just for you to think about. Um, the next question, Kel. What do you think your initial response would be 
based on the feeling that trig you were, that triggered you in the card. So without any thinking, what do you think your response would be? And then <clears throat> what could be the impact of that response? If you just have the triggered feeling, react it. And then finally, and this is the most important question, is, is it the impact you would want? Hmm. Right? Yeah. And if we can walk ourselves through that, I think we can find more compassion in our things. Sometimes it is the impact you want. Sometimes you feel like you just you know have to do it, but it becomes a process that is now conscious as opposed to something that's happening unconsciously. Something that you know you're gonna have to maybe apologize for later because you were angry and you didn't think and you just reacted. And so what compassionate dialogue does is really say, I am going to control my emotions and I am going to engage. I'm going to try to assume positive intentions if I can, I may not but I'm still going to seek to understand first because in the repair, if in seeking to understand through my interruption and my questioning, it turns out that your intention was in fact to harm me, then I know that my repair is again, a reason, a season or a lifetime that we may not need to be interacting anymore. And that is a form of repair, mm -hmm. But it's, it's gone through as opposed to kind of what's happening now in our society where we're ghosting people. Like all of a sudden you just stop hearing from someone, you know, all of a sudden you're blocked or you're unfollowed or you're, you know, you're muted or whatever they're calling it now on social media. Um, and you don't know why. Um, here you've gone through the process and you're clear that when you let someone go or you are able on the best case scenario to deepen the relationship, You've, you've been purposeful about it. Thank you so much for uh, your participation in that. Um, and, and just to kind of follow again on that, recognize, just take a moment to think about what that felt like to just have that kind of conversation with each other. So what we find is that when we slow down and that recognize, we actually learn a lot about each other and about our perspectives, which going back to that first slide of, you know, building trust and building team, um, you know, it, again, it, we don't all have to be thinking the same way, but that, that ability to have that kind of conversation with each other, you know, we learn about each other so that we actually can work more effectively with each other and also have more compassion for each other and a deeper understanding of where somebody's perspective is coming from. And so when we have that kind of regulation and understanding of each other, then we can really start thinking about, okay, so now how are we gonna, how do we wanna address what came up? And what we wanna offer is again, this reflection on why am I interrupting? So there's, um, there is a statement, an experience, um, a constituent concern. Something has been brought to our attention. I've recognized what I feel about it and now I wanna start to engage. And oftentimes what we find is without that kind of regulation, sometimes the reason we engage is because we wanna prove that we're right. We wanna change somebody's mind, um, silence someone, get them to admit that they're wrong. And those are all really driven from our unexamined emotions and needs. So if I'm interrupting only to get my individual point across, um, where is there space to actually learn anything or discover anything? And so, that this is an important, um, just again, self-regulation moment that we, and nobody knows this except us. So if I feel this topic, why, why am I engaging in the way that I am? And am I really engaging as a way to understand and learn, or do I have an agenda that I'm trying to push? And there's nothing wrong with having a strong feeling about something, but if I stay in that personal agenda space, it's really hard for me to actually be open to hearing what somebody else might need and how we might actually create a way forward together. And so again, if my why for interrupting is I'm in this, I'm in this tense moment with you, this hard moment, but I want to interrupt to build trust with you. 
I want to interrupt to build a space where we can learn how to do this together, or I want to interrupt to build empathy and understand. So if we can have that kind of framework and kind of support each other to stay in that why, again, we can build that muscle in a more um, productive way with each other and, and really find a way of discerning what's going on. Um, because sometimes, again, we, um, there is more collective way forward than we think there is, but we've got to slow down and get into this space. And so part of that is also thinking about why, why don't we engage? Why do we shut down sometimes, especially if it's a very charged topic? And um, I'd like you to just kind of look at these as they populate up. And, and see what resonates for you. When there's moments when you find yourself disengaging or being silent or not really saying what you feel about something, um, which of these might resonate with you? So some folks, I feel like I don't wanna always be the squeaky wheel trying to bring up the same topic again. So I'm gonna be quiet. Am I gonna be um, rejected from the group if I bring up something that is counter to where the whole group is moving? Um, I don't feel like I know enough, so I don't have the right data or statistics to answer this. Um, am I going to speak for a whole group? Fear of professional retaliation. Is this a safe space for me to bring this out into the group? Um, and sometimes we have our own issues around it, or if we find ourselves in a position of being someone who is trying to keep something that is not um, collectively popular on the table, it can be really tiring. And so again, if we can try to keep that, um, that collective interruption happening, this is for a goal of us to be able to dialogue. We don't put it on one person all the time to be the interruption. And if there's, if there is someone who keeps bringing something up, how do, how do we support them and invite them into a conversation instead of keeping them on the outskirts of it? Um, and I think too, the, the information piece, especially in positions of leadership, I, I don't know how to respond to this because I don't have the right information. But as you all did with Dr. Dome, um, you had a really, um, your dialogue had a lot of depth and that was just about recognizing your personal experiences. So you didn't have to have all the data about something to get a conversation going. And so it kind of alleviates this that I, I've got to know everything before I can engage because the point of interruption is to actually learn. We're never going to know everything because um, we only have our perspective. So the way to actually learn is to engage with people who have a different um, experience from us. And so the strategies that we use to do that um, kind of can, can come in a lot of different ways and, and you will start to find the one that is the most effective for you. And so um, is it to ask to clarify the meaning? You're using a word and I wanna make sure I understand the way you're using this word because it may be different than the way I'm using it. So as Dr. Dome was talking about that safe and un unsafe and uncomfortable. So that could, if, if she hadn't stopped in that session to clarify, are we even on the same page? probably that participant would have shut down in the space, which everybody else in the space feels, and that session would have only been able to go to a certain depth. So if we can slow down and ask, let's make sure I understand what you're saying. Um, help me understand what you meant by what you did. I don't know if you intended this, but it felt this way to me. So help me understand what your intent was. What are you feeling about it? Um, one of the biggest ones is that separating the doer from the deed. So again, can I talk about how your statement or your action is impacting me instead of saying you are a whatever, right? That, that kind of statement of condemning the person, there isn't anywhere for us to go. But what we're talking about is the action or the statement that came out of that person's experience. And so if I can dig in there, one, I can understand you more as a person, but also there's space for us to actually grow or change something. Um, addressing the impact, she talked about that. How do I help you understand that um, your, your intent is important, what you were thinking and feeling, and also is the impact. And for us to have a healthy space together, we've got to be able to talk about both of those things. 
Um, one of the ones that, that I find myself using a lot is this offer another perspective. So I'm, I, I wanna hear you and I wanna be able to share, I've got a different understanding of this or a different perspective. And this can be really important just especially if something comes up in a space and we feel it and we feel anger or hurt or frustration. Um, it's important for us to, to share another perspective so those kind of things don't just stand as the only space in the room. It's important for us to understand what are all the different pieces when we're talking to each other. And, and those last three are really about we, we have to find a way to move forward through this together. So again, can I remember that the way that you're showing up in the space is usually not the depth of the substance of what's going on for you. So I wanna acknowledge that you are, you are having a real experience. Anger is really how you're feeling at the moment. And how do I include you in a conversation with me so I can understand what that is about for you? Um, I think especially when we're talking about topics that can feel divisive, we stay on this surface with each other and there's not a lot of movement that can happen there until we can go down into more of the, what does this mean for you as an individual? Help me understand what's happening for you and I wanna share what's happening for me so that when we make decisions, we're, we're considering all of those perspectives in that. And so we actually have some sentence stems that we invite people to use. And again, this is kind of that toolkit to build the muscle. So one of the toolkits is that, that feelings wheel. So can I, can I understand what my emotion is and have a way to practice identifying that? And when I do that, what are just some of the quick starters that I can use that are gonna help me regulate myself and open up a conversation? And what we found is that, especially if it's a, if it's a conversation that is, is eliciting a strong emotional response in you, sometimes asking a question is one gonna give you a moment to self-regulate and, and you don't have to have an answer for it. So really tell me more about that. Can you help me understand? Is, is just you're opening up a doorway, but you're also giving yourself time to regulate. So thinking about um, questioning, sharing an impact. And then that final one really goes to what we were talking about is like, I, I hear this emotion in your voice. So let's talk about how we can how we can navigate that. So can I affirm how you're showing up? Can I ask questions to understand what it means for you? Can I share my perspective so that we actually have a clearer picture of the landscape that we're working in? And then Dr. Dome will talk about that final piece um, is where we kind of commit to um, staying engaged with each other, working through those first two. Yes, thank you, Kelly. So the third part of the part of protocol, the repair it, um, is this idea of how do we keep the issue on the table? And I, it says until it's resolved, but again, I wanna say that resolution doesn't mean that we fixed it, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so a re resolution in the broadest sense, um, inviting connection and inclusion, right? Um, Kel, go ahead and push. There you go. So um, when we when we want to, these are things to consider if we want to repair, these are some strategies. Um, sometimes it's about just seeking and sharing more information and experiences together. I find that the most important repair for me is always engagement, but I'm, I'm a complete 100% people, people person. Um, I wanna engage, I wanna talk. I, I'll be the one who sits down knee to knee with you and just have that interaction. And then sometimes it's like, okay, let's figure this out together. Let's explore this together. Um, so I, I, send, I tend to be in that place. Um, I can give you an example of more information though. I, I did a presentation and uh, a woman in the presentation, she had a really hard time with one of the, um, one of the concepts that we were talking about. And um, she wrote me after, she used a protocol. She's like, you know what, I'm struggling with this and I just wanna know more. And I said, you know, I, I saw that, here's an article that might help, right, to do it. And so I just sent her an article and, and that kind of was trying to, Again, not convince her not to change her mind, but it was like something that allowed her to go deeper that maybe she could hear better than me. And she read the article and she's like, oh, I get what you were saying now, right? And again, 
her, her saying she got it didn't mean that she agreed with me necessarily, but she understood what I was trying to say. And so we were able to have this dialogue. So this idea of sometimes we just need to have more information and more exposure right to and I, and I say when I create a team, I don't want a team of people who think just like me. I really don't because uh, the way that my team is going to be the, 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 the best and the most innovative is when people are bringing multiple perspectives, when people are saying, hey, have you tried it this way? Or you know what? I don't do, you know, do this. This is where we grow because I know that I have, you know, I'm, I'm educated, but all my experience has been in K-12 and, high, and higher ed. And so when I'm talking about corporate, I don't really have that, 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 Th those chops. And so I need someone who's going to help make me stronger. So I want to be surrounded by strong people with differing perspectives, because that means that we're going to be more innovative together. We're going to be more creative together. Um, we can offer to learn together. Um, we can follow up and acknowledge engagement, uh, bring issues to a larger group. Sometimes we just like, I don't know enough about it. Neither do I, neither do I. Let's, you know, let's study together. So these are all ways to repair, but you can notice that what they all have in common is that they're about uh, working together, about collaborating, about us figuring this out. It's not my responsibility. Um, it's our responsibility. Um, and then, um, uh, the bottom two, you know, model what it looks like to be respectful and engagement. That's part of the repair too. And, and also setting, setting boundaries for engagement. Like this is what it looks like here. This is how we're going to do it so that we can avoid having these issues come up over and over again. Next slide, Kel. And so when we repair with the, goal, with the goal of staying in relationship with ourselves and other people, we sometimes have to challenge our own perceptions and prejudices and look for commonalities rather than differences, right? I constantly have to look at what I am bringing to the table as I do this work here around equity, but also just in general, my engagements. And I have to always ask myself first, how might I be contributing to this? Right, so I get to challenge myself. It's not always about you're wrong just because you think differently. It's like, is there a place for me to grow in this as well? The next one, be curious about the things that make us different and seek, um, seek out reputable resources to expand your perspective um, on race, culture, and those, those that share differing viewpoints. I mean, uh, we can sit here all day and you can be sure you're right and I can be sure I'm right and we're not any closer to resolving any issue and we're no closer if we're here and we're talking about supporting all children we're no closer to that goal if we can't figure out how to understand each other and then the last one is sometimes we just have to make amends sometimes we say things we do things that are harmful even if we didn't try to um and sometimes we just have to take responsibility for them. And, you know, I, I, I'm happy to say that I haven't run into that much lately in my adult life, but just the other day I put my foot in it. And, um, and I, I kind of just thought about it and, it and it was on my mind. And I know for me, because I really live the protocol that I had to make amends that evening because what, again, it was intent versus impact. I know that my intention was not to harm, but I saw the impact because I saw the faces of the of the that were the result of the comment I made, and so I repaired it. And and for me, that's you know I'm being vulnerable because I'm not perfect. I'm a human having human experiences, and therefore I will make mistakes. It's just a matter. It's not if. It's a matter of when. And so if we can really understand that we you know give each other grace to have a human experience and not show up perfect every time, and then but hold each other accountable when we don't. Then, then that that's the direction we want to go to. It's not about perfection. It's about communication and collaboration and, and, and working together. So this kind of puts us close to the end of our of our uh, presentation. And so we just invite you to reflect um, on, you know, we, we kind of did a a real fast <laughs> run through of the protocol. And you know, we planted a seed, uh, but the seed has to grow. So you know, what is your initial thought about using the process, the protocol, the RIR? Um, what do you think will be some of your personal strengths 
and challenges with the process. So an example, the, the gentleman who shared like, I'm not good with feelings, you know, maybe that's a challenge that you have. Um, so the next question would be, what can you do to address those challenges? And so that's just an invitation for you to think about, um, you know, everything that Kelly um, and I have shared this morning and think about, um, you know, is this something that, that you think could work for you? Um, and, um, and then what will be those kind of pain points in, in um, implementation? And we just wanted to end with um, this understanding that this, this process is used in multiple ways. And so there, there's an interpersonal way to work that protocol, which is um, me really challenging and questioning my own beliefs and perspectives and making sure I'm not getting stuck in what is always going to be a limited perspective because it's only based on my experience. So when there are issues that come up or beliefs, how am I willing to recognize what beliefs come up for myself? A ask my own questions. Why do I believe that? What experiences have led, have led me to think that? Um, and really recognize what emotions come up for me and then work to repair. Is there something personally I need to learn more about in order to make sure I'm not always acting from just my limited intrapersonal perspective. And then the second piece is the interpersonal then. And how, so how do, we, how do we use this as a way to dialogue? So I'm recognizing this is coming up. I have some questions for you. And so again, this is we're agreeing on, on a baseline language and process for how we're gonna navigate these things um, so that when, when there are moments of tension or conflict, we're not all individually trying to figure out how to have that conversation. We, we've got a protocol for how we talk about these things. And then the, the final piece of it is it's also a way to think about organizational practices, policies. So what do we recognize um, in, in these pro, pro, um, excuse me, practices and policies? And then what questions? How, how are these impacting people? Um, what, what, what do we need to understand? Because when we are also further away in positions of power from the on the ground impact, it becomes more and more important for us to make sure we're hearing from the people directly impacted by it. And these all weave together and um, you know, I'll offer a personal example. So I'm at the, the trainer team that I support um, are all women of color. I'm a white woman as their like manager. And so I am, my responsibility is creating programming, thinking about our um, coaching processes. And I have a limited perspective on what it is like for my team as women of color to be in these facilitation spaces. And so if I'm basing our processes and our curriculum just off of my perspective, I'm actually not setting them up for success because I'm not understanding what does it feel like for you to be in that space? What do you need? What is your perspective on our programming? What things am I missing? And so first there's an interpersonal piece where might I be assuming that my experience is a general experience when it's not? And then the interpersonal is actually having that dialogue. Hey, I'm, I'm coming from this perspective from my experience, but what is yours? Is the way I'm talking about this accurate to what you're experiencing? And then once we can have that conversation, it actually shifts what our programming looks like. So, it, so again, it's, it's building that muscle of just open dialogue so that our organizational practices, one, can be the best possibly for everyone who's going to be impacted, but also they've been created with collective perspective because we had those conversations. And nowhere in there is there a judgment about someone's individual experience. There's nothing wrong with my experience or their experiences, but they're not the same. And so can we just talk about it to make sure our environment is inclusive of everybody and we're moving forward in a way that is, um, yeah, it, it is that sense of belonging um, and we're building our trust together as an organization, even through different perspectives. So we have one last piece for you. So the invitation here, um, again, I know that this has been really quick and we are so uh, appreciative of your active participation in this process. So our invitation is for you just to think about these things. What's one thing that you're thinking after this? What's one thing that you're feeling or what is one thing that you will do? And so we'd love to hear, you know, just one of those three 
maybe a few of you who would be willing to share what's come up for you after this, you know, our presentation. I would share, uh, you know, even in the, uh, the activity with the cards, I think even reflecting on that, and I think with this conversation as a whole, if I drill down to the words that originally come to mind, it, part of it just comes down to, like, partly, I, I think I, I have a sense of hopelessness would be the feeling uh, mm -hmm. that things, you know, things don't always change, and so they may not. Um, but I think that's probably important for me to recognize walking out of here uh that doesn't have to be the reality but that is the feeling that kind of comes up in this conversation for me okay thank you so much for sharing appreciate that is there anyone else yeah i'll, I'll go um although i'm not sure if it's a thinking or a feeling but um optimism mm -hmm. i guess that's a feeling is that optimism Yep, absolutely. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so that's that that's how I feel right now. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I'm feeling happy because that we're putting all this out there for all our staff and everybody to understand this. Uh the old mm -hmm. saying goes, my father had always taught me, you know, the three second rule, like you're saying, think about something where you're gonna say it before you say it, because when those words go out, you can't take them back and they can do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do that. I've done in the past. We all make those mistakes. But then it's also the seek to understand to be understood is the empathy. Mm -hmm. and that makes me happy that we're showing for me happy that we do need to understand other people and be empathetic and, and to walk in their shoes first to understand. And then my also my father taught me that the same thing that I see here, the same process is if you mess up, you fess up and you clean up. That's the repair mm -hmm. that you do in life. And those have been so long wisdom that here that a lot of people haven't been really educated on that. So I'm happy today that this process is out there. That could sums up and you guys done a great job of doing that. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who'd like to share? Yeah, the, the one thing I'm, I, one feeling I have is just thankful uh, just hearing this information and even, you know, in all honesty, it was the first time I've ever heard of the emotion will. And I actually got a little curious and, and brought it up online to take a look at it. And it just kind of puts things into perspective on your feelings and, and, you know, how to address some things on it. So it's just, you know, I'm, I'm just thankful that you guys brought this to us so we can have a better understanding and like, uh, our board president said, just to develop more empathy uh, towards others. So um, I, th I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would just say that I, I appreciate the goal of um, wanting to build more trust and understanding. You know, I think in um, and, and this idea, you know, I think your conversation on, on discomfort was an important one because <clears throat> You know, I think in a lot of ways, we are conditioning students to, um, you know, not be comfortable with discomfort because we um, essentially just try to protect them from difficult conversations in a lot of cases and, um, you know, kind of institute this thinking that if someone disagrees with you or if someone, you know, kind of pushes back on something, that that is somehow unsafe, as you said. And whereas mm -hmm. I think it's good to encourage those conversations and encourage really the mentality that we can have a conversation respectfully um, to develop a better understanding of one another. And we can walk away from that conversation with a different opinion, um, but still be able to have a relationship as, as human beings, you know? And so I, I really did appreciate that, you know, and I think, um, I think that's something very, very important to impart on our, our kids and our students as well. So, yeah, thank you. You know, and, and we think we're, we think we're protecting them and yet we're setting them up for failure in the future because right. it, it, I don't know a world that we're, that we're ever going to live in where there's not going to be some form of discomfort or conflict that happens. It just is a, it's a nature of living. And so um, it's better for us to be prepared than not prepared, you know, for that and normalize it. 
Thank you all. Um, any other comments before we hand it over to Dr. Pease? No, thank you very much. That was awesome. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And oh, Kelly G, thank you. That was so quick. Before I get started, um, President Short, I really like your comment about mess up, fess up, clean up. I might have to steal that and use that for. Uh, <laughs> I think I gave like you the last time too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there we go. Um, before we get into the actual policy, I'm going to be talking about uh, data and the reasons, the why behind the, po uh, the policy as it relates to the RIR protocol. So I'm going to start with the SWOT analysis. Um, upon my arrival to FCUSD, um, I conducted an informal SWOT analysis as it relates to educational equity. So some strengths that exist within our organization include a leadership team, which embraces reflection and change. And in my conversations with teachers, support staff, administrators, and um, some parents as well, and they're all excited about uh, getting better results for our students. And many want to be actively engaged in the work, but need a system of support to do so. So I was able to also recognize that our stakeholders are very proud of this community and are active participants in our system. As I explored weaknesses, I was able to identify that our data clearly indicates that we have work to do as a district in addressing uh, inequities within our system. And later on in the presentation, I'm going to cover some of the data uh, that reflects that. Additionally, in education, we tend to look for quick fixes. So we jump to what's known as solutionitis. We jump to solutions without really exploring the root causes of problems um, or the problem of practice. And in my analysis, really trying to uh, find the opportunities, and we have many that exist, and uh, we need to continue to increase student voice. We need to continue familial affinity groups um, within our current parent summit structure. Uh, Ms. Cabrera and I, we've already began planning for next year, so we're really excited about that. And also to increase diversity amongst our staff in order to improve student outcomes. And finally, reimagining education post-pandemic. And then the last piece of the SWOT analysis are analyzing the threats. So um, the threats that currently exist in our system include racism, implicit bias, uh, the mindset of colorblindness and opt-out culture and a lack of understanding for what educational equity is and what it looks like. Next slide. So the work of establishing this equity policy began under the guidance of the former social, emotional and academic coordinator. He worked very closely with the equity task force in reviewing existing policies from Oakland Unified School District, Cincinnati Public Schools, um, CSBA and Minneapolis public schools. From the examples, the team began drafting a policy. That policy was then uh, created and then taken back to the equity task force at large to get mm -hmm. feedback. And we asked some questions uh, for, for them to, as they were looking at the policy and wanting to provide feedback. So the questions were, does this policy set universal goals? Does the policy set an explanation? <clears throat> excuse me, that data is utilized as part of building the more equitable learning environment? Does this positive policy support the development of the whole child? And does this policy support culturally responsiveness, um, identity affirming and rigorous curriculum and pedagogy? So after the feedback was um, received, it affirmed the efforts of the team and we had some minor adjustments that we needed to make. Uh, those edits were then made and then we proceeded to get feedback from principals and assistant principals. And we asked a different set of questions as it relates to the scope of their work. So how does this policy achieve the purpose and desired outcomes? What concerns or uh, implementation issues have been identified with the draft policy? And uh, what relevance does the policy have to operations? And lastly, what new information needs to be included? What needs to be done to make this policy um, consistent with external and regulatory requirements? Next slide. So here's where I'm going to make the connection between um, 
the policy and the protocol. And this is the recognize it piece. So as uh, Dr. Dome and Kelly shared, recognizing is uh, really about questioning how we think, feel, and believe. And if we think about how we think, feel, and believe, um, this it impacts educational instructional uh, pra uh, practices and initiatives, and it also impacts students' ability to learn. And so the data on this uh, bar graph, it highlights student outcomes by race. So if we look at suspension, which is the first one, um, the suspension rate data from 2018 and 19 was retrieved from CDE's data quest. And the suspension rate is calculated by the unduplicated count of students suspended divided by the cumulative enrollment of the selected population. So in the 2018-19 school year, because that was the last school year of full in-person learning, according to CDE, Black students in our district um, were suspended at a rate of 15.1%. Hispanic students, 5.5% and white students, 3.1%. When we look at um, our special education eligibility comparison data, this data represents the number of students within an ethnic group who are eligible for special education. Overall students with disabilities represent 12.76% of our student population. And of the students receiving special education services, 17.83 are Black, 16.41 are Hispanic, and 11.53 are White. It's also important to know that at the time of the data collection, the Black students made up 7.24% uh, of our student population, Hispanic students 21.96%, and White students 46.28%. Additionally, the risk ratio uh, for, for um, identification indicates how much more likely a student from a particular racial or ethnic group will qualify for special education. So for black students, our risk ratio is 1.44%, which means black students are 1.44 times more likely to qualify for special education than other students. Mm -hmm. um, Hispanic students risk ratio is 1.40 and white students risk ratio is 0.83. So you may be aware that special education has its own set of performance indicators. There's 14 that the state of California or the Department of Education, CDE, uh, monitors. CDE monitors four of the 14 indicators uh, specifically for disproportionality. So they're related to rate, discipline, race, discipline, special education eligibility, and special education placement, uh, the least restrictive environment. So CDE uses a risk ratio analysis to determine the district's disproportionality. And in July of 2018, our district was identified as being significantly disproportionate over three preceding years. The 14-15, 15-16, and 16-17 school years in two indicators, uh, one being over suspension of African-American students of disabilities and the other being the over identification of African-American students as emotionally disturbed. In 2019, FCUSD um, was identified for a second year for significant disproportionality for both years. Each year, a coordinated comprehensive early intervening services plan was developed to add to the district's dis disproportionality and in June 2020, the district was identified as significantly disproportionate um, in the identification of African-American students with emotional disturbance. So within the CCEIS plan uh, for the district's third year of significant disproportionality, it, which was approved by the board in December of 2020, the district um, will be out of significant disproportionality for the 21-22 school year. However, the district was disproportionate in the suspensions of uh, Black students with disabilities in the 1920 school year. An additional two years of disproportionality will result in our district being significantly disproportionate again in the 1920 school year. And African American students with disabilities are 4.26 times more likely to be suspended for less than 10 days than other students with disabilities in our district and 3.53 times more likely to be suspended for more than 10 days than other students with disabilities in our district. 
in doing um, cause analysis, disproportionality in special education is a direct reflection of the disproportion disproportionality in general education. So I know that was a lot to digest there. <laughs> um, the next um, title is our chronic absenteeism rate. So chronic absenteeism data was collected as of May 2021 from our partners of attention to attendance. Black students had a chronic absenteeism rate of 12%, 12 Hispanic students 7%, and white students 3%. Our graduation rates um, are from the 2019-20 year adjusted cohort graduation rate. The four-year um, adjusted graduation rate is the number of students who graduate from high school in four years with a regular high school di diploma divided by the number of students who formed the adjusted cohort um, for the graduating class. And that cohort is based upon the number of students who enter ninth grade for the first time and adjusted based upon students who transfer out over um, the next three years for that transfer into the district late. So the cohort graduation rate for black students was 82.9%, which is below the district's 91.1%, also below the county's percent of 88.8 .8, and the state total of 87.6. Hispanic students also uh, graduate at lower rates than the district, county or state with a graduation rate of 83.5 while 93.9% of their white counterparts graduate, which is above the district, county, and state totals. In 2019, the California dashboard um, significantly highlights differences in how students are performing in math and English. Our math data as a district is 0.6 uh, above the state standard, placing us in the green. However, when you disaggregate the data, we see that Black and Hispanic students are in the orange, and more specifically, Black students are performing 82.4 performing points below the standard, Hispanic students 54 points below the standard, and white students are at 7.6 points above the standard. The same trend exists for English language arts. The district is in green with all of our students performing at 28.7 points above the standard. But again, when you look at our student groups, um, you, you will see that Black and Hispanic students are performing lower and it continues to incline each, decline each year. Uh, specifically, Black students are 44.7 points below the standard, Hispanic students 18.4 points below the standard, and white students are 39 points above the standard. So as we refer back to the board policy, the first two paragraphs of the policy are really about us recognizing and questioning our practices for our students of color, specifically Black and Hispanic students. Next slide. So the interrupted step is about engaging in a way that creates open and honest dialogue around difficult issues and helps us understand multiple perspectives. So as a district, we've analyzed and um, had the opportunity to reflect on our student outcome data. We've listened to student voice, held parent summits of marginalized student groups, uh, experienced uh, and witnessed racial unrest and working through the impact of a global pandemic. So this is a call to action for all of us. And so as we reference this side, we created um, the, you know, the opportunities for students, staff and community partners to provide us honest feedback through their educational experience. And much of the feedback from students and parents confirm the data that racial inequities exist within our system and believe that a board policy is the next step for accountability for our district. So the board policy interrupts business as usual by requiring intentionality on all parts of our organization, the district, from the school, and as well the classroom. Next slide. So now we're getting to repairing it. And again, repairing requires us to come up with actionable steps that as a district we could do to repair and broaden our awareness and understanding as it relates to equity. But in order to repair harm and broaden our understanding, this uh, board policy really outlines actions that we shall take. It also, it's also important to recognize that equity is not a destination, but it's a journey. So as we evolve, 
with our, we, we must evolve with our society and with the culture as well. So each of the points on the slide um, are efforts that are already in, proce in process and we intend to continue. And additionally, I want to acknowledge that we have the opportunity as we bring everyone together after uh, post COVID-19 pandemic, um, that we have, we have a really proud community and uh, we consistently score at the top of local school districts on nearly every indicator and we're growing in enrollment. And we have positive relationships with our community. However, the challenge that we face consistently is that we have predictable achievement and opportunity gaps for our students based upon ability, race, and class. And the pandemic has made clear the inequities throughout our society for black and brown students. Educational equity is about being responsive to students we are serving and modifying our instructional practices and policies to raise the achievement for all of our students while accelerating the growth of students in our significant subgroups. So California is one of the most diverse states in our country and Sacramento County has been recognized as one of the uh, most diverse communities as well. And all of our students need to have the cultural proficiency to work, live, and contribute as members of a diverse community. And this policy will build the capacity in our staff and students. Our board policy will be the North Star of our district for all of our initiatives. It helps us to build our strengths and interrupts our predictable achievement gaps by focusing on culturally responsive practices. We appreciate the support of uh, the support and leadership of our board of trustees in this work. And as I conclude this presentation, uh, our EPIC team is going to frame a dis discussion around the board policy, utilizing the RIR protocol. Next slide. And Ms. Goldsmith, if you wanted to bring up that policy, thank you. Nancy and Kelly. Thanks, Dr. Please. Um, so, so while this is up, we just, we wanted to, um, just have an invitation to practice what we just learned. And this is really that organizational, that third piece, um, that I shared about how the protocol works and it's, how do we use it to actually look at our practices and policies? And so, um, there's two pieces that we'd like you to, um, start with. And it's really that recognize and interrupt is where we're gonna, we're gonna start. So, the idea is um, when you're thinking about um, reading this, going back to that emotion wheel, that perspective, um, we, we have some questions for you to think about just recognizing again, before we jump into action or that external questioning, again, slowing down like we did in our conversation to have you just think about what actually comes up for you when, when you're reading this, what feelings come up, what thoughts, beliefs come up for you, um, what words, you know, cause you to pause or what concepts cause you to pause. Um, so Dr. Peace, I just want to check in. Do we, um, would you like me to frame those questions on the slide and then give opportunity? Cause I can put them up as a visual and, and give the board time to then look at it. Is that the flow that would work best? I think that would be great. Thank you. Wonderful. And then I'll go ahead. Um, thank you. Let me go ahead and share our screen. Great. And so this is the, the first place just to stay as you're as you're reviewing the policy. So taking a moment to read through it. And again, just before projecting out, staying in. So what words jump out to you? What feelings or thoughts come up for you? And just recognizing, is, is there anything in the policy, you know, um, that is new or that raises that curiosity piece or that you is challenging? So maybe challenges a way, challenges a perspective that you have or a way of seeing something. Because again, when we recognize that, this is your opportunity to regulate that piece and think about how are you going to do the interruption? What questions do you want to ask? Mm -hmm. And as before, we really encourage you to share out. You know, this isn't, uh, this is a process for us to like practice together. So we love to hear, um, and you don't have to go through all three. Um, if, if there's a question that resonates with you the most, start there, but because that's all part of recognize. And we will go to interrupt, so there will be that discussion point. So again, just inv invitation to just first stay in that uh, in that recognize, and then we'll yeah. have an opportunity to go to 
interrupt. Yeah, any board. I'll, I'll ask one question, um, you know, and I, I do have more probably in the other sections, but um, I actually underlined a few terms. Um, but I did want, you know, I think the, the term that jumped out to me the most was culturally responsive and would love, I mean, I don't know if this is the place to ask it, but would love to better understand um, what that means in the context of this policy. So that is an excellent interrupt, but we're going to ask you. Okay. <laughs> I figured I was not in the, yeah, you're not going to do this right. But. Yeah, no, well, there's no wrong. I mean, it, this is a learning process. And so um, when you, when you, when you hear that terminology, uh, culturally responsive, what feeling comes up for you? Like what, what is it? Is it, is it curiosity? I don't want to plant words in there, but again, um, what feelings? Um, well, I, I think it's, I, the feelings are that I think it's, it's an admirable goal. Um, and I would just say, I don't know if curiosity is probably a good, a good way to put it just cause I want to know more. So. That's perfect. Okay. Anyone else that, that, um, that recognize what is it? Because, and, and that question is a great question. So we'll get to it to the next one, but let's, let's stay in that. What else comes up for us? as we, um, as, cause I know that you've had an opportunity to review the po policy, you know, beyond just what was up there for a few minutes. Anyone else? Yeah, I, 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 at first I saw some of the red lines. I don't know if we have the red line version. How did we get the red line version? Uh, it's just, that's just what we have. Yeah, it's just that's David. Yeah. That's David. Okay. Because yeah. I noticed some of the things in here relative to that is social justice and social justice learning, social justice standards. And I just want to talk about that, put it on the table because um, what does that mean? What are we talking about in those in that realm? And again, I'm going to give you the same invitation. And th this, I think, is the probably the greatest challenge with the protocol, especially when you're used to being in action, is what's what's underneath that those that that question. So that question you have is an interrupt. But first, like, what makes you even want to ask that question? What comes up for you in your body? Uh, fear. Maybe there's something unknown in there that might cause controversy. Yeah. I love this group. You guys, you're all amazing because you you just you're you're tapping in so quick and you're and you're getting it. Yeah, okay. That and that's and that's real. So you have one person who's coming from a place of curiosity, you have another one who's coming from a place of fear. And so what does that mean as we get to the interrupt if we're not taking a moment, as Kelly said in the beginning, to really sit with, okay, what is what is my motivation? Right, because in understanding our motivation, you can now ride that that wave of fear and really get to those questions that are going to help you, you know, combat that and understand so that it's no longer fear and you have an understanding, um, or or the dialogue that needs to happen so that you can get to a place where it doesn't exist anymore. So thank you so much. Um, anyone else? Chris, at this time at the same time. Okay. All right, so we'll go to the next slide, Kel. So with the interrupt, <clears throat> remember it's a reminder that, you know, what questions do you have that will deepen your understanding? And we already have two great ones. And then the second question is, what impact do you hope this policy will have on students you serve? Right? So things to consider. So if we want to go back to the the first one to now, whoever would like to ask their question uh, for the interrupt, uh, that, that's great. I think we're here to talk a little bit about that. Well, uh, one of the questions that I uh, have is regarding the term equity. Um, I have heard so many different definitions of equity over the past year, it, it's, it's a little bit mind numbing. And, um, and I guess sarcastically, I, I almost feel like the term equity can be used 
uh, to justify anybody's viewpoint, uh, even people who have opposite viewpoints. Uh, because what one person is describing as equity from their standpoint could be the exact opposite of what someone's describing as equity from their standpoint. So from that, that perspective, you know, I, I, I do wonder um, why have we not taken the opportunity in this, this draft policy to define the word equity so at least everybody can be on the same page as to what we what equity means as it relates to this policy. And so, Mr. Reed, um, if you refer back to the policy, there is a statement defining equity. It describes it as giving student each student what they need in order to be successful. So, um, and I agree with you that the term equity, it's often used incorrectly. And a lot of people have substituted for equality, which is very different. Mm -hmm. So equality is giving each person the exact same thing. So you get $1,000, I get $1,000, Ms. Dome get $1,000, that's equal. But I might need $1,250. Ms. Dome might need $800 and you might need $3,000. So based upon your need, you get what you need in order to be successful versus equally distributing. So if we look at it from an educational standpoint, if we look at distributing resources, we may end up giving a school with higher need more um, allocation to address the need of their students. But if from an equal standpoint, everybody would get the exact same dollar amount to support their students. I hope that clarifies the yeah. difference between equality and equity and how it relates to educational equity. So in that example, would you ever have a scenario where you would um, have someone with a negative dollar amount? So um, in other words, you said, you know, 3,000 here, 1,000 here, 800 here, and over here it's minus 200. Well, in education, our goal is to educate children, which requires money. So never would there be a negative uh, balance for a school who's responsible for educating students. So the, so, goal, the goal would be to lift everybody up, but, it, but how we lift everybody up might differ based on school site. Correct. Okay, thank you. And I, I think a, a good way to think about that, and you know, it was a discussion we were having years ago when you know, standards came out and um, in general, just you know, state standards. And, um, and it's this idea that a standard is a goal. And if this is the goal, if we have this benchmark, um, if someone's above that benchmark already, it doesn't mean that we stop. We, we, we have another one. We have a benchmark that says though, everybody in our system that we support needs to be at least here. And so when you go back to the chart that Dr. Pease shared, it's this idea when you have this line and you saw this negative impact of some of the, of the systems, the, the goal would, that be, would be that everyone would be on the right side of that bar. Right. And so we have the standard and we're saying every kid. So there's a kid who may be just below the standard who needs the support to get there. But there may be, you know, some kids who are way below the standards who need something different. So when you talk about educational equity, it's really about getting everyone. If, if you're saying that this is your standard, you know, and if you've said it in your mission statement or your values, like, you know, 91% of our kids will grab, you know, whatever those numbers are, then how do you ensure that every kid gets to that standard that you've shared? I, I appreciate that if I may. That, honestly, that sounds a bit different than how we're defining equity within the policy. If the policy is that every student would meet their full academic potential, I mean, for some, that means they're gonna go far above the standard. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's part of what I would wanna clarify is are we setting a policy that everybody meets the benchmark, that's worthy. I think we should do that. Or are we saying we're setting a policy where we're gonna reach the full potential? Our goal is for every student to reach their full potential. Right, and the, poli and the policy as it states is to reach, for each of our students to reach their full potential. Th that is always the goal. Um, and I think, you know, part of, um, you know, my experience, um, I can't speak for Dr. Pease and, and, and for Folsom directly, but my experience is that uh, 
we, we see it as we, we come at this notion of equity from a sense of lack, like there's not enough for everybody. So when we give, you know, I'm going to put in quotes, those kids that extra boost to hit that standard that somehow it's taking away from someone who's already met that standard and has much more potential to go beyond it. And, and that is that is not correct about what equity is. Equity ensures that everyone gets here and also ensures that we're reaching potential because we're not stopping at the standard. The standard is not the, it's not the gold standard. If it was a gold standard, then everyone would be, yeah. it would be even higher. We're not stopping at the standard, but we're saying this is the minimum. And I don't think in any district that we're ever satisfied with the minimum, we're saying we need the minimum to, 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 get kids so that they can go on, but we're always striving for something above that. And so, you know, equity is not about taking something away from someone who doesn't need it. It's about giving people what they need. And then when you really begin to, to kind of feel it, I, I use the analogy of, of you know, I, I now at 54 wear glasses. I haven't wear gla worn glasses my whole life, um, but you take these away from me and I can't see, I literally cannot see you. And so equity is like, I need glasses, but Kelly doesn't need glasses yet. She will in five more years if she keeps looking <laughs> at this computer. But, um, but, but you, so you give me what I need so that I can be successful. You give Kelly, Kelly may need something else, right? Um, uh, and so it's, and, and, and some students, you know, we think that our gifted and talented, our kids that, you know, we've named that our kids who are excelling don't need something. And I'm going to, I'm going to push back and say that there is not a student in our school who doesn't require some level of supports in some way to reach their full potential, whether it's SEL, what, whether it's, you know, um, academic, whether it's, you know, whatever, whether it's, you know, as simple as food in their belly so that they can get those physiological needs met. You know, we're all showing up differently. And if we can create space to allow that says me feeding you to ensure that you have breakfast in the morning is, um, is going to ensure that you can have a good day and stay focused so that you can focus on your work. Um, doesn't mean that because I didn't offer you breakfast um, because you had breakfast at home, it, it's not, and that's the equal part that, that Dr. Pease was talking about. As long as we're stuck in this notion of equality, we're never, we're never, gonna, we're never gonna meet the mark. And I will push every day to say that every kid in your system needs some level of support. We just got to figure out what it is so that they can all reach their, their greatest potential. If I may, Mr. President. Yeah. Um, so Dr. Adam, I, I completely agree with you. Um, and I, I think we're, okay. <laughs> I, I'm going to invite everyone to dive into some discomfort with me here because I think a lot of the issues, um, it's not so much a confusion between equality and equity, but it is truly, how do we define equity? And I, I Dr. Peace, I think this definition of equity, and I, I realize that it's bolded in this, in this document. Um, I don't, I, I think it absolutely belongs in there and this is a good start, but I do think we need to expand on that definition. And I think, um, so I would say that I completely agree with this definition about, um, you know, giving students what they need to develop their full academic and social potential in order to graduate, et cetera. Um, however, I don't think that that's enough. I don't think that that is the level of detail that we need. Um, and I'll tell you why, because, um, while we're sitting here today saying that equity does not mean a negative to others. Um, it, you know, I, I think we're all in a, I, I hope that we're all in agreement on that. Um, I think, that, but you know, when you look at the illustration, right, there's a million different illustrations of, of equity. And I always like to look at the one because I'm a baseball fan. I think there's one where there's a baseball game and there's a person that's tall enough to see over the fence. And then there's a person that needs two boxes to see over the fence. There's a person that needs one box to see over the fence. And, and, and I think we need something in here to share that in the definition where equity to our district and equity as we define it is using our resources to lift others up. I think something along that has to be in here, but not, but equity is not bringing others down. And I bring this up because there have been efforts in this district, and this is where the discomfort is going to come in, to do the, 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 that, that second piece, 
where it's about bringing others down rather than using our resources to lift everyone up or to lift those that need it up, I should say. Um, and, you know, one perfect example of this uh, was, and Dr. Peace, you weren't here for this, but was uh, the grading issue in our district. You know, we were the only district in Sacramento County that chose not to give grades to our students uh, versus uh, what most districts in our community did, which was give students the option of either choosing a letter grade or choosing a pass, no pass. Now, equity was, was the reason that was used to justify this policy. And in that context, I would absolutely argue that that was an example of in order to have equity, or maybe in this case, it was confused with the quality, I don't know, is that we need to ensure that nobody can get a grade. Uh, we need to ensure that the kids that were coming to our board meetings asking for their grades because they wanted them for college transcripts and for scholarships, that those kids were not, should not be able to get a grade. Um, that to me is a perversion of equity. Um, and I think, I think this is why we need to expand on this definition because the focus should be on how can we lift others up. Another great example, and I know everyone wants to go home today, but I think this is a really important conversation. Another great example is honors AP uh, classes. There are efforts in this district on a regular basis that want to see those things go away. And again, that in my mind is a perversion of equity. It is not seeking to say, hey, how can we improve our diversity? How can we help more of our black students, more of our Hispanic students, uh, give them the resources they need to get into these AP courses and these honors courses so that they can use that to their advantage as well? How can we do that? How can we raise that up? Um, versus we need to bring the standard down and we need to say that, you know, we should not have honors or we should not have AP options so that all students feel like they're on the same level. And, and this is something that's going on in our culture, in our state. This is not, you know, obviously just our district, but um, in my mind, I think that our definition of equity needs to emphasize that our goal is to use our resources for those students who need them to raise them up. And, and not to have this perversion of equity that we sometimes see in our, in, in our culture. So that, that's just, that's my perspective, but um, that's kind of where I'm at with this definition. And I would love to see us expound on that a little more. And so Mr. Hoover, if I could respond to your, your comment, um, first by no means with the definition of equity, does it imply that we are lowering standards for anyone? We are not. We have high standards and expectations for all of our students. So. Um, I don't know what presentation uh, you may have heard where that uh, perception uh, or the interpretation was made about lowering standards, but by no means as an organization are we lowering standards. What I will draw your attention to is the first bullet within the policy that indicates what an equi equitable system means. And it talks about enacting policies, distributing resources and supporting programs such that each school can effectively respond to the diverse needs of its students. So it does address distributing resources in order to lift up each of our students. Uh, if you would like hmm. more uh, specific detail in uh, the bolded definition, I'd be happy to work with the team in order to expand on that definition, but I just wanted to draw your attention that it does in yeah. this policy highlight the of, of appropriate distribution of resources. And that, that first bullet point, by the way, is I think fantastic. I think it's a, a great um, explanation of what you know, an equitable system looks like. Um, and so I actually have a check mark by it on my paper here because I thought it was, you know, I thought it was right on point. Um, and, and I am, you know, again, I, I, I understand that when people say equity, that's not what they implied. But what I think the experience I'm speaking of, and, it, and it's before, Dr. P.C. you were with our district, is that in the past, equity has been used uh, in, a, in a different manner. It, it's been, I'll, I'll even say, co-opted. And that kind of, if we leave the definition broadly defined, I think it can be used in the wrong way. 
and and, and in my opinion it has been used in the wrong way in the past um to lift others up but to to take others down so may, may i ask a question and so um so part of and i'm, I'm going to bring us back to the protocol um so i i hear your points so my question is um how how can how these are the kinds of conversations that have to happen right it, it's not about going back and forth and saying well you know this is what's happened here and this is here um we understand i think that there is a an intellectual understanding of why i'm going to go to your ap honors example why that might have happened um and i can understand why there's frustration around that right so when we get to the interruption though it's like what can we do so that it becomes a win-win right what what can we do and and it's it's not enough to say um, you know, provide supports for black and brown children. So I'm going to give you an example of a district. So Vallejo, just down the road, not too far from you all. Um, this is probably now 10 years ago. Uh, they wanted to expand their ninth grade um, honors to all to, to um, they wanted it to be more inclusive. And they got pushback from board, from, uh, from uh, teachers and from parents, because they said that you're, you're taking something away from our kid. Right, because th those kids, there, there was just this thinking of those kids. So what the committee did was they decided, well, you know, since we're getting so much pay, uh, pushback, we're going to just have ninth grade honors for all students. All students will participate in ninth grade honors. And what was not surprising to me, but surprising to some of the naysayers, there were some kids who didn't do well in it, but more kids achieved because there were higher expectations and, and, and they had access. So how do we, we have to get creative, not about like this or that, it's really about both. How do you get creative about how you're including, you know, kids who have been historically left out of these programs, how do you get creative so that they can be there and then scaffold it so that they can succeed? Because it's not enough just to get them in the seats, right? You got it. I mean, getting them in the seats and letting them fail is no, no good. You have to give them the resources they right? need. We have to, and, th and that's the equity piece, right? And, it's I like, think, and again, I think what I'm asking- That is the definition. Yeah. And, and I think- I'm asking, in the policy. Right? Yeah. And, and, and those policy conversations are going to happen and yeah. obviously they're not part of this policy. Um, they're going to be things that we discuss separately, but this policy is obviously here to inform us on those discussions in the future. So I don't want to get too into the weeds, but I, I think it's as simple in terms of defining equity. I think it's as simple in this to define equity, similar to my illustration earlier, of adding those boxes to the kids that need it and not taking away opportunities from kids that may not need those boxes, right? And so uh, again, I think the way I described it was some sort of phrasing in here where equity is about lifting others up, not taking them down. Um, I think that's that it's really as simple as that for me. Yeah, and you know, I, I just shared my screen and I really appreciate that. I think this is the dialogue we have to be having. So you bringing this up is so important because we have to get to it. Um, but I wanna invite, you know, I, I, I mine's a soccer field, but I wanna invite just to look at this because the one thing that they did and why um, this particular graph spoke to me was that it took it to the next level of justice. Right, and this notion of root cause, and I think that that was also in Dr. Pease's presentation about um, fixes happening in the district, which sounds like that's one of those. I think your example is one of those fixes without having all the data, right? Necessarily could be, uh, but that's not my job right now. Um, but this idea is, how do we get to the root cause of the, the disproportionality? How do we get to the root cause of the lack of access. And then when we can do that, then they're, then we're not worried because everyone's getting what they need. That's the equity piece. But we're also getting justice because we're eliminating the root causes that led to the inequities in the first place, right? And really focusing on eliminating the predictability of outcomes right. based upon a student's race, ethnicity, home yeah. language, personal characteristics, or culture. That's what the equity policy is really about. Eliminating predictable, um outcomes yep. based upon so, those characteristics yeah so you know so i think and i'll stop sharing and shut up after this is that you know one of the things i think is you know what does then what would that definition need to look like right for for you to feel like like really have that conversation i mean the, and i know that you're going to have more i know that this is the beginning but what 
what what's missing so this this is the protocol what 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 not not like there's something missing but specifically what is missing and then that becomes a conversation and how can we ensure that those kids get what they need um, in your equity definition, it doesn't take any away from those who does, but what, what do we do to ensure? And I'm, I'm gonna give one more example. Um, uh, our, our district shoreline that we work with, which is on the, um, in the Sonoma coast, when COVID hit, you know, the first response was to roll out, like let's get computers to everyone's hand. But part of the problem was, and one of the teachers on, on the team spoke up and said, you know, not all of our kids have uh, access. I mean, they have. We can give them the computers, but they don't have broadband. They can't actually use them. And um, the the board really wanted to roll it out, but the superintendent talked to the board and the teachers, and they said, "Look, we're going to delay the rollout for three weeks and ensure that we can get broadband to everybody, so nobody gets left behind because they don't have the economic resources." And of course, families were upset initially about this. And and you, I would invite you to talk to the superintendent, Bob Rains, there now. Um, and talk about the full process. But at the end, once they got, they got Google involved, they got broadband everywhere, because what it meant was there was more urgency. And I think this sometimes feels like that takeaway that you're talking about, right? So those families who had broadband, they had to wait three weeks. And so that feels like something's being taken away. And, um, but when you have a community focus, by making sure that that everyone had to get it, there was an urgency that might not have existed had it only impacted in that in that community, mostly their brown their brown students. And so in three weeks, they got all this stuff involved. They got connectivity, they got computers in the hands of every student in that district, and they were moving forward. Now they're talking about after that first response, their last year, more sense of community, people working together, understanding that we're stronger together and their support. So I'd, I'm not gonna say 100% of the people at the end thought it was great, but there was a, a, a shift in belief about we, we did this together and we're stronger for that. And so I, I invite us to, and this is the conversation, and this is where the protocol will serve you, is to really investigate you know, the, the notion of taking something away or something, you know, if someone waits a week, is that taking it away? Is that, is that, is that somehow diminishing? Um, because they still have access, they still have computers in their home, they can still continue. And so um, this is the broader conversation and I think it's worthy to have. It's absolutely but, important to have. Dr. Dom, that, that comes to the thing is like defining the equity definition as Mr. Hoover says, but again, in context, when we made that decision to do that, it was exactly that. They had the, the kids on Ranch Cordova's side don't have access to resources. So by setting them up for failure, by requiring grades, as we know now we have the data that shows 30% or more were disengaged. A lot of them didn't have the families. We have a huge uh, uh, learning loss there or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. It actually harmed them too. So when you're making these policies, you got to think about the bigger picture it's a give and take on both sides so again it was taking away from them also so you got to really balance it out so that, that's the context the pandemic induced a lot of different things that had never been seen before yeah. and that's where the equity came up and rised and started to, we're talking that discussion now so that's just one put that in context yeah no uh, thank you i and I, I just was using an example i really don't have the information but i was just sharing that you know i think there is a perception and what we get to do is dive into some of the perceptions of, of, you know, again, going back to this notion of lack and something being taken away. And what does it, what does it look like if we look in the, in the big larger scheme about, you know, how we can then rise together from that um, it's stronger. So just in, just another perspective. Okay. Mr. President. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I first like to say that I agree 100% with the comments of uh, Mr. Hoover. In fact, I think he, I, I almost felt like he was channeling uh, my thoughts. Uh, so, um, you know, honestly, I mean, equity is a, is a great term. It's a great um, uh, principle and it's something we should embrace. The challenge that, and I'll be honest here, that the, the challenge that we face within the community is the perversion of the term that occurred uh, in the spring of 2020 in this very room. And 
you have a tremendous number of people who in the community who are very, remain very upset. Uh, to this day, that if I look back, I've only been on the school board three years, but that is the one discussion and one vote that to this day, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm still pissed off about, I'm angry. And there are a lot of people in our community who are pissed off and angry at that decision that was made in this room uh, in, uh, in uh, late April, early May of uh, 2020. And, and you know the, that perception that has, I guess, um, filtered out into the community is the perception that is, is the reality for many people in our community because they say they have equated that action of denying grades to students as what this district um, has defined as equity. Um, and, and that's unfortunate. I mean, honestly, the pan if it wasn't for the pandemic, I think you would have universal embracing of the, 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 this, this concept of equity. And it, it's not to say that, that you know, we can't overcome it, we certainly can. Um, but that is, again, what's in the back of people's minds when they hear the term equity. Um, I even had one person describe it to me um, on that uh, baseball or soccer field example, um, that it, it was a situation where the tallest person was standing in a hole, um, that they dug a hole and had the tallest person stand in that hole. In other words, bringing them down in order to create the equity and that bringing that, them down was to take away the opportunity for a grade. Um, so, you know, I, I, it's just something that it is what it is. And, and we need to not forget that we made that decision um, in the spring of 2020. And that has clouded, influenced people's of, uh, opinion on the term equity. Um, uh, but I, we certainly can overcome that, uh, and, and we will overcome that. But I, I, I mean, to, but I just wanted to add that on to uh, Mr. Hoover's comments, because I, I think we need to constantly have that in the back of our mind during this discussion and go out of our way to, you know, let people know that this policy is not designed to bring anybody down. It's to lift everybody up, but how we lift everybody up might be slightly different. You know, it doesn't mean that it's, we're lifting people up equally. It might be, you know, like this, uh, but we're still lifting everybody up. And I think as long as people understand that, that no one is going to be brought down, but everybody's gonna be brought up, I think we will get the, the universal support of this, um, this concept. But, but you know, I, I think you know, we will need to make some, some tweaks to, to ensure that people understand that that's the desire. Um, so I, I just wanted to put, you know, add some additional context to uh, what Mr. Hoover indicated um, uh, because you know, unlike other districts, you know, obviously we have our own, um, perceptions, our own reality based on our own history um, that may or may, you know, may, may or may not be known by, by some people in the mix. Um, like, again, as, as Mr. Hoover said, Dr. Peace wasn't even with us uh, during that time period. Um, and I, I, I mean, I remember um, asking, you know, for a definition of equity uh, back in, during that time, because I, I still wasn't, was a little unclear what, how they were taking the term equity and, and coming to that um, result. And I remember they couldn't, I, I couldn't get a clear definition. Um, uh, in fact, the person who was trying to define it kind of ended up saying, well, it really can be a, a, a bunch of different types of, of things. So, you know, that, so that, that's the reason why I wanted to, um, uh, to follow up with Mr. what Mr. Hoover said. Thank you for that. And if you don't mind, I'd love to just put it in the, again, the context of the protocol of what I'm hearing. So like, um, it almost feels like repair, 
right now, right? You recognize some things that came up with COVID and there were interventions that were put in. And now you are thinking about what is that, what is the result of those? And again, if you think about that repair, where are there places to make amends, learn more, keep engaging? And so what I'm hearing is you're recognizing that um, what, what was the impact of the decisions that we made. And so I think this is a moment for that transparency. So we're recognizing we've got a lot of different feelings happening amongst ourselves, amongst our community about, about what happened and how we approach this. So here's our, here's our opportunity because repair, it's not one, two, three, we're done. Repair is, is this cycle. So now we're in a moment where we get to learn. Okay, so we're recognizing what are people feeling? Frustrated, angry, happy, where are we at? So given what we learned last time, now what questions do we have? Okay, now where are we gonna target? So what I'm hearing coming out, which is a great learning moment is we need more specificity about what we mean so that we're all on the same page when we're talking about equity. And I think it's also a moment, um, you know, again, we, we build, we repair and build relationships too with transparency. So it's, you know, hey, we, we moved this way and here's what we're learning now and here's where we're gonna take the next step. So thinking about recognizing what people are feeling, what are the conversations that need to happen now and who do they need to happen with? So that, so that now that next step forward is more informed and you're taking into consideration, um, not that we failed, but we learned. Yeah. We learned something and what we're learning now when we draft a board policy is we've gotta be more specific about our language. And that's gotta come from the conversations that happen amongst the leadership. What do you mean by it? And, and who do you need to talk to in your constituency, in your site, to understand, um, to make sure that your definition is not gonna lose sight of supporting the students most in need. Because, because again, that's the whole reason we're having an equity conversation. So how do we hold those tensions? We know this is the objective why we're even having this conversation. And we wanna hear to make sure we're not causing uh, other impacts that we're not intending um, when we do that. So I think, I think where you, where you're at is really a beautiful place of we, we made a move on it, which is important because some spaces don't even ever make a move on it. So we're moving, we're trying, and now we get to regroup and repair and learn so that we can start our next cycle for this next year and get real clear about what we mean by that. So I, I just want to encourage to, it's, it's also a good place. It's a learning place that you're in right now. Um, which again, when there's discomfort and tension, that's when we can innovate. Yeah. Um, so thinking about for you all, who, who, what are those conversations that need, need to happen? Who do they need to happen with? And what's the process gonna be for this leadership to, to, to come to a place to understand this is our collective definition that each of us can stand by. Mm -hmm. We can speak to it um, because we've, we've grappled with it together. Right. And, and that's the process we were in a state of emergency we're in the recovery stage right now. So that's the repair. And yeah. that takes a long time, a lot of healing. Yeah. And, and also know that it's, you know, the, the RIR is not just this like linear, like it's one direct, like you go back and forth, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's like you get to repair and then you, you do something and then you're like, oh, we got to interrupt again. Right. And so what it does is it, it makes room for the human element for, and it also says that, you know, we tried something, you responded, right? And there were some, there were some good things and some things that, that, that were, you know, that had a negative impact. And so now you get to interrupt again. And so know that this is a cycle. And as Dr. P started at the very beginning, she said that this is not a destination. It is truly a journey. And so we're going to be working through, and you're going to be working through these issues um, well, as long as you're sitting on that board, you know, th that those are going to come up. And so, but using the protocol, it takes some of that emotional charge out of it. And it lets us really deal with what, like, I, I love that you, like, I'm pissed. Yeah. Okay. So what does that mean when you're pissed? And then how do you, how do you ride that wave of being pissed off? And then get to a place where you can like, okay, but I can see why this happened here. And then again, it's not about you conceding, but it's also not about the other person conceding. It's about collaboration. It's about working together. And if I could add to um, that, the, the recognition from students, community members, particularly our communities of color. And if I could speak freely and use the phrase that Mr. Reed used, our communities of color, they are pissed. 
they are angry, they're frustrated. So those are their feelings. They're able to recognize those feelings. And so the interruption coming into board meetings, expressing that, hoping to engage in courageous conversation, brave and safe conversation. Mr. Clark heard uh, from our Black Families United Parent Summit where Black families shared that they did not feel safe communicating at board meetings. And they were speaking about emotional safety. So they don't feel that this is a space where they can come and give that honest feedback. So then how that, that the summit was an interruption, right? And then when we talked about the discussion about the emotional safety, we have a collective responsibility to repair that. And so like Dr. Dome shared, we, it's not linear. We can jump between the different steps of the protocol, but our community has recognized, our, our um, community of color has spoken up and recognized their feelings in terms of their own educational experience. And I think that as an organization, as a board, as cabinet members, as leaders in our district, we have um, an ethical imperative to reflect upon that. And it's our responsibility to repair that because they have been clear with us about their feelings, their beliefs about how we perceive them. And it's our responsibility to repair that piece. And that is what this board policy is a uh, attempt to begin that work. And if I can interrupt, Dr. Peace, um, it wasn't just the African-American families uh, that have stepped up. I mean, the AAPI, they, mm -hmm. they weren't comfortable uh, speaking uh, at a board meeting, um, you know, but they used the, the coin of, it's just not our culture. We just, you know, get along to go along to get along but it's like okay but you still need a voice and then even our hispanic community it's like they feel as though there's nobody representing them you know even though i, I could be comfortable saying that we have hispanics on the board but they still didn't feel comfortable and still didn't feel in that safe space to come to a board meeting to talk about what's going on in their community or how they were feeling. So I think it's just those communities of color and we're, we're addressing that with the parent summits. Um, but yeah, they're just, they're just speaking their voice right now. Okay. Good discussion. Thank okay. you. And, and just to clarify, I think the, um, the situation on the grading, it was, just, we still haven't really heard from our communities of color on the grading issue. They didn't even have a voice at that time. It was speculative that that it was going to damage those kids without lack of resources and stuff. But uh, we'll see now in this recovery stage with data and actually maybe if we can hear what they had to say, we're going to see a lot more going down the road in the recovery stage. So I think it'll be a, a learning experience. So I want to thank you all for that. So Hopefully we've got to wrap it up. We went up quite a bit over. It was a good discussion. Do we have any other um, good for the order here? The board wants to make any final comments on before we adjourn. Can I just ask a clarifying question? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, I'll just do it all at the same time. Um, I, I just want, with respect, I mean, we did hear from a community of color. Our API community was very upset about the grading decision, but um, and, and I, I also wanted to ask um, Dr. Peace, and you don't have to answer it today, but maybe uh, in a future meeting or in an email, um, you know, I, I noticed that the, the chart that you showed um, with the data in your presentation did not include our API students. And that was a little surprising to me. I, I think we have, um, you know, four, you know, very large um, groups of students in our district, including our API kids. And I would love to see um, kind of their numbers as well in that, in that uh, as well, because I, I definitely don't want to forget that uh, about them either. Um, but I guess my clarifying question uh, was just about next steps. Are we going to, because I don't feel like we got to really dive too deeply into the policy today. So are we going to get another discussion opportunity oh, before I, it comes back? I guess action? we're going to act out to Dr. Pease. Are we going to bring it back I, to I just want to make from, sure that we're for more discussion, I would presume on an agenda for in the future. Yes. Meeting. And I, I think this was the first step in that process. Um, and it really was board requests to have an opportunity 
to you know to even talk about a a, a topic that we're going to have a board policy on, but mm. having a real deep dive, and we've never really done a deep dive on a no. board policy. Mm-mm. And I want to commend this board for you know really taking this this step seriously. But it does also indicate to us we have more discussion to do, and oh, maybe yeah. we you know mm-hmm. we engage again with some of you as our facilitators to bounce these ideas back and forth, because this is great dialogue. I think a lot of things are being brought up that really is going to define the framework of equity, which is key. It's key in everything that we do going forward. So I don't want to cut the discussion short. I know where our time is up today, Mm -hmm. but I would encourage us to set up another time for another discussion on the policy, whether it's at a regular meeting or another workshop setting. But um, I think it's it's a great, great first. And I would time. encourage that with more data too, as we've learned before, and bring in, in more information for us. Yeah. And um, if I could add one more piece before we um, conclude and um, allow public comment, um, I think it's worth noting that several local school districts have uh, taken a stance for uh, educational equity. Elk Grove Unified has an equity strategic plan and board policy. San Juan has an equity task force and board policy. Rockland Unified and Placer County, mm-hmm. or I'm sorry, Placer Union High School District, they've also taken a public stand on equity. So we have a really great opportunity here. And um, I look forward to us engaging in the conversations to Mr. Hoover to address your question regarding the data. Um, I was intentional because I wanted to uh, highlight based upon our data and the state data and you know the significant disproportionality we are disproportionate with specific subgroups. So those are the groups that I utilize the data for, but for pre- future presentations, I'd be happy to include um, the data from our AAPI community as well. It'd be great, thank you. Mr. Mr. President. Yes. Um, so uh, my apologies uh, um, that I didn't have an opportunity to send this to, uh, to Dr. Peace. Actually, I should have. Um, but I, I did, when, once I got the, the board policy yesterday or the draft board policy, I spent uh, the better part of last night uh, um, looking it over, thinking about it, and then um, uh, doing a red line. Um, I, I'm, uh, I draft policies and in, in, in legislative bills for a living. So I, I guess I'm, uh, that's it's my, uh, my, down, <laughs> my downfall because whenever I see something, I just turn on the red line tool and start, start working on it. Um, uh, but I did uh, distribute it to my, my colleagues this morning, um, but I will uh, um, save it as a PDF uh, um, and send it to uh, Dr. Peace as well. So she uh, has an opportunity to, to look at it um, and provide her thoughts. Uh, but just generally speaking, um, you know, either out of the, the, I mean, I don't think anything I did uh, put here is, would be really perceived as controversial. In fact, I think if anything, it just strengthens uh, the proposed policy, um, including expanding um, the, the, the number of, um, of uh, characteristics. Um, I, I, I mean, I love the characteristics that were listed you know, in, in the policy, race, ethnicity, home language, culture, um, but, but I felt like it was missing some uh, of the descriptive uh, characteristics. So uh, the list that I um, uh, replaced with it is, is a more expansive list. Um, uh, and uh, I also, you know, I, I, this one I actually felt fairly, um, I felt was, uh, was fairly important. I, I did um, add, as my colleagues can see, uh, a, a first bullet point under the directions of what FCUSD shall do. Um, and, and I'll just read it, it's, it's short, but it says FCUSD shall develop an annual report for the board, which provides a breakdown of each school site and the academic performance of students at that site by race, gender, primary language, and any other characteristics deemed appropriate by staff. I think one of the most important things for the board to, to be able to see um, and be able to react to, to ensure that we're moving um, all students up uh, is um, quantifiable data um, on an annual basis that shows the annual changes um, uh, uh, by school site. Um, uh, and uh, 
you know, with that data, you know, I, I think that kind of serves as uh, um, a touchstone. So you know where you're at, where you were, and then where you're going. And um, I would even uh, go so far um, as to, I guess, humbly request or, or suggest that the board entertain taking the slide that um, Dr. Peace provided, which was, uh, I think it was slide seven. It's actually the slide that uh, Mr. Hoover was just talking about. Um, adding the AAPI to that, and then also indicating the, the years the, 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 that the data was, was uh, culled from. And putting that as a permanent um, slide in each agenda of the school board, not necessarily for us to have discussion on, but I think to remind the board at every single school board meeting where our challenges are so that we um, are always reflecting on any decision that the board takes that is our decisions going to raise everybody up and is it going to correct the deficiencies that we have um, within certain populations. Um, so, you know, I, I thought that was a, I thought that was a great, a great graph that Dr. Peace created there with the exception of we need to add the AAPI on there. And actually I would also suggest we add gender. Um, I think it would be interesting to see all of those categories that you had listed on that slide but rather than uh, showing it by, by race, I'd also like to see it by gender um, because there could be a scenario that we need to raise a certain gender up um, uh, uh, as well uh, you know, as, as certain races. So uh, you know, I think there's um, a lot we can do. It's, it's, it's kind of exciting um, what we could potentially accomplish. Um, you know, we just need to set the stage um, so that um, all communities feel comfortable with what we're doing um, uh, and understand uh, that, um, that we have the best interests of all students in, in, in mind. So um, I will share um, uh, this, this red line, or I'll, actually, I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll send it to the superintendent yeah. and we'll then the superintendent. Yeah, electronically, it'd be nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, okay. Mr. Reed, it sounds like your um, the data that you're requesting is similar to what the California Data Dashboard has available mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the public to view. Um, I would just advise you that it. I don't believe the the data dashboard from CDE um, disaggregates data based upon gender. Yeah. And so, uh, also recognizing that not everybody identifies with a specific gender. And so to also keep that in mind when we're looking at uh, disaggregating data as well. Well, uh, yeah, and we, we can base it on uh, how people self-identify their gender. Um, it still would be, um, I think, useful. And you could even have three categories. You could have, you know, the gender, um, the male, female, or, um, or as self-identified male, female, and then you could have um, other or something. I just still think it would be important for us to be able to uh, visualize um, how, how our students are doing. Um, because if there's a great disparity between those gender classifications, that should be a red flag for the board saying, okay, why is this happening and what can we do to change this? Much the same way as we should analyze by, by race. Okay, we're, this is a red flag because uh, this racial um, classification is not where other racial classifications are. So why is that? What can we do to change that? Um, so it's, and, and, you know, the other, I guess, important thing uh, perhaps is to maintain a history, um, like historical slides, I, you know, in this annual report that I mentioned, it would be great to take that, you know, the slide and, and, and recreate um, data from, let's say the 2015, 16 school year, the 16, 17, 17, 18, 18, 19, and going into the, into the future. So that school boards, uh, future school boards can uh, look at the slides over uh, a period of years to see how things are progressing. 
Um, hopefully all lines will be going up, but if any line goes up and then plateaus or even goes down, that creates the opportunity for the board to say, all right, well, how come these lines were going up, but then how come they plateaued or why did they go down? Um, because it could just be one policy decision or one policy change or one circumstance that created that, that might've created the, the upward slope or, or the plateauing. Mm -hmm. And so we learn from our mistakes by being able to see historical data and where we're going. So um, just an idea. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other final comments? Okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Yeah. Yes. Uh, there, there is a public comment. I don't know if we were accepting. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. How many do we have? One. One? Okay. Bring them on board. On. Um, Please try to unmute. Hello. Hello. Yeah, please identify yourself. Hi, my name is Dr. Arne Brown. I'm a parent in the district. Um, I've been in the district for a very long time. I have two students who graduated and one student who's graduating this year. I want to thank Dr. Pease for your vision on just presenting the facts and for leveraging partnerships with Dr. Dome and Ms. Cole. The presentation was a breath of fresh air. Um, however, I must admit towards the end of this meeting, going back to that emotions board, I felt a lot of anger and disappointment at the consistent effort from two board members to talk about community. And let's be clear, the community that you're talking about are homogenous white parents in Folsom, and it's not black parents like myself, not Hispanic parents, and definitely not AAPI community members. Um, when we talk about even the grades being denied and even like the insistence and emphasis on differentiate, differentiating language for equity, perfection is the enemy of good. And I feel that that is an effort to just derail and deflect from the work that needs to be done. Equity is equity. Dr. Peace defined it. The proposal looked great. You know, the emphasis on adding more and more and more to satisfy a small parent white group you know, it's, it's disappointing and it's a slap in the face. And once again, when we talk about repair, we cannot repair what we're afraid to admit. Black and Hispanic families have been historically marginalized in this district. Mm -hmm. I've had, you know, my son, you know, is graduating from Vista. He was asked by his counselor whether or not he got an intra-district permit and we live walking distance from our school. So let's just be real about the disparities and be real about the community. We are not a community in this district. It's the have and the have nots. Mm -hmm. And whenever we talk about black and Hispanic students in you know, Rancho Cordova, they are the have nots. They need advocacy and black parents like myself have failed to advocate for them, but I'm here now. And I'm saying, I want us to be clear, Mr. Hoover, please stop the microaggressions with black people who speak to the board, including Dr. Pease. Please stop always asking for clarification for basic terms that we all know to satisfy a small group. It's disappointing, it's disrespectful, and the time is up. We're sick of it. It's many parents who, who stand with me who have that understanding, and you know they don't have the, the luxury and the privilege to speak, but I made time today to do so. And I came in feeling really good about the presentation, and at the end, you know, again, that white fragility kicked in, and it's the same thing I've seen at every single board meeting henceforth. And I know it's gonna happen. Please take these tools from the ethic training and really do some self-reflection because it is clear microaggressions that I've seen time and time again. And, and you know what? It's disappointing. It's so disappointing. And I know we can do better as a district. Our children's future, and not our, meaning the, the kids in Folsom, including my kids in Folsom, I have money, we're okay. I'm worried about the kids I work with in Rancho Cordova. Those kids cannot stand by while we nitpick every single word because their lives and their futures are on the line here. We need culturally responsive education. We don't need board members to say, well, what does culturally responsive mean? You are educated, Google it. Look at the peer reviewed research. Look at what Dr. Pease is presenting, Dr. Dome and Ms. Cole. We don't need everything to be nitpicked to satisfy a few voices. We need change and it's, and it's an urgency that we cannot ignore anymore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, do you have any other speakers? No? Okay, bring it back to board. Any final comments before we adjourn? Do I have a motion to adjourn? 
I'll move it. Do you have a second? Second to adjourn? I'll second. I'll second. Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Short. Aye. Mr. Hoover. Aye. Mr. Clark. Aye. Mr. Gooey. Aye. Mr. Hearn, thank you.